I was pretty excited when I finally got my driver's license. My family was great too, and they bought me a new car as soon as I did. Of course, I took full advantage of this and drove all over the place whenever I could. It was a convertible Mustang, and it got me a lot of popularity in school. Everyone was wanting to go for a ride. Unfortunately though, this car also got me the ire of this guy named Billy. He had never really liked me much. My dad was a doctor and my mom was a writer. We did have things pretty comfortable and his family was less well off. He seemed to hold that against me in particular for some reason. So when I got this new car, it made him dislike me even more. He had a car too, but I guess he was angry with me that it was a beater with a heater as people called it. I never made fun of him or anything like that though. Hell, it was a nice car, and the point of a car is to get you somewhere anyway, but he still resented me for whatever reason. One night after a high school football game, I decided to take a few friends home before heading home myself. When I left the school, I noticed Billy's car pull out behind me, I didn't really think about it too much though. I did keep an eye on it just to make sure, as I dropped off two of my friends in town. He'd followed me the entire way. When I stopped to let them out, he stopped right behind me. When I started to back up, he followed me there as well. Billy made absolutely no bones about the fact he was following me. It was almost as if he wanted me to know this. The third friend of mine lived a bit further out of town, on a rural road. It was a pretty far out drive, so it was going to take a while to get my buddy home. Sure enough, when we pulled out onto the route, Billy followed close behind me. It was nerve-wracking. I hadn't even thought about calling the police earlier. At this time, I thought it was probably too late. I wasn't going to get any bars at all that far out into the country. Billy followed us really closely too. It was really scary, because the curves on the road were pretty wild. Many times I was scared to hit the brakes at all, because he would have rear-ended me with how close he was, and sent me flying over the edge. I was actually a bit surprised he hadn't done that on purpose yet. He was clearly up to no good, either trying to scare us, or sincerely wanting to hurt me. Fortunately for me though, I was driving a brand new Mustang. My friend had a long driveway up to his house, you see, so the moment I turned into it, I floored it down the driveway and left Billy in the dust. We got to the house and ran out of the car inside. Before he was able to make it all the way up the driveway, I wasn't really sure what to do now. We all had to agree whether or not to call the police. I mean, sure, he was following us, but he hadn't done anything yet. When I watched him hop out of his car, though, and walk towards mine, I told my buddy to call the cops right now. I wasn't sure what Billy was doing, but I was sure it couldn't be anything good. I didn't figure out what it was until I saw him light a match and throw it on my car. My car was instantly caught on fire. I found out later that while we were rushing inside, he'd poured gasoline all over it. My friend's dad went upstairs and grabbed his rifle while my friend called 911. By the time my friend's dad got outside though, Billy was in his car, leaving. I wanted to put the car fire out, but his dad told me not to go anywhere near it and get back inside the house. Billy's fire was only on the top of my car, luckily. It destroyed the paint job, the convertible top, and the interior, and burnt the hell out of the frame. But the fire went out before reaching the engine or any flammable liquids. If Billy had wanted the car to explode, he didn't do a very good job of where he'd place the gasoline. The last time I ever saw Billy was in court. He was being sentenced. His petty attitude really screwed up his life pretty badly. I also had full coverage insurance. So when you look at his actions, he gained nothing by being a jackass to me. He went to jail and I got my car fixed in the end. Oh well, I guess that's how it turns out sometimes. I don't really want to tell you what area I live in. I guess no one will really do anything with it, but it still makes me a bit paranoid. 
It will suffice to say that I grew up in a nice traditional country town, and there were a lot of nice country roads in the area. Some of them were a bit notorious for being makeout spots for teenagers. My girlfriend at the time lived in a really nice old house out of town. Her family was quite wealthy, and their home almost looked like a plantation. I had to drive out of town down a country road for a bit in order to make it to her place. Along that road is an old covered bridge. I've never really liked driving across it, though. It was very creepy, and I was always worried the old thing would fall apart on me. The worst part was just how creepy it was. I had a horrible experience on that bridge once. I had been out late on a date with my girlfriend, and by the time I got her back home, her entire family was already asleep. I had to quietly drop her off before heading home myself. On my way back towards town, my car began to make some strange noises, and before I knew it, it turned off altogether. I had to twist the wheel in an effort to get it off the road. I tried to use my cell phone to call for help, but I couldn't get a signal in this area. I didn't know the first thing about fixing this sort of issue in a car, so I had to decide what was better, trying to walk back to my girlfriend's house or walking back towards town. Since my girlfriend's family was already asleep though, I opted to head back towards town. I began the long walk there. It was extremely creepy, and it was a very still night. Only very seldom was there even a slight breeze. The moon was the only source of light out there. Although it was just enough to walk, it really wasn't that great at viewing the surroundings. I didn't normally find myself getting scared of the dark or anything like that, but at this time I was definitely a little apprehensive. Those backcountry roads can be a whole lot scarier than city roads at night. Eventually, I came upon the bridge. I had forgotten all about it in my worry because I'd been so concerned about my car. If I had thought it was dark along the road, though, that was nothing compared to the pitch black facing me inside this covered bridge. I was hesitant to walk inside as I couldn't see anything in there. I couldn't exactly go around, though. It was over a large creek and I had no plans of going swimming that night. When I got up to the entrance of the bridge, I hesitated for a long time. I don't know exactly how long I stood there, dreading having to walk into that darkness. Like jumping into a cold swimming pool though, I realized if I just got it over with, that would be so much better. I walked slowly into the bridge. It was dark. I know I keep saying that. But I mean it was so dark that I put my hand up in front of my face and I couldn't even see it right next to me. I could see some tiny light coming from the opening ahead. All I could hear was the creaking sounds of my feet as they pressed down on the old wooden boards. I kept my eyes focused on the other end and I knew I would be there quickly. Suddenly though, at the opening of the opposite side of the bridge, a dark figure walked in and blotted out the light. I stopped, suddenly surprised that anyone else was out here at this time. As I stopped walking, though, the creaking sounds of the boards did not stop. Someone was walking behind me, too. I instinctively turned around. I couldn't imagine these two people were up to anything good. I couldn't see the person behind me at all, so I decided to try and run for the opening. I could see the figure of the man standing there just barely. Before I could even begin, however, a person grabbed me from behind and shoved me head first into the wall of the bridge. I felt a bunch of hits on the back of my head before I blacked out altogether. When I woke up, I had the worst headache I ever imagined. I was still laying in the bridge and my head was throbbing. I could feel blood pouring down the back of my head and when I tried rubbing the painful spot, I could tell whoever had attacked me had taken all of my clothes. I got up swaying a bit, and began walking awkwardly toward the portal of the bridge. I got out of it, and saw that I was indeed completely stripped and bloody all over. I had only taken a few steps out of the bridge, when I collapsed once again. Next thing I remember, I was in a hospital bed. Apparently, I'd been laying outside on the bridge bleeding all night, until my girlfriend's father had to drive to town for work. 
He saw me lying there and rushed me to the hospital. I never found out who it was that attacked me. I guess it could have just been a simple mugging. I didn't exactly have any enemies I could think of that would plan this sort of thing out. In the future, though, even driving across that bridge was a terrifying experience. There's a small covered bridge that leads into a historic downtown area, not far from where I live. Ironically, the bridge itself was built much more recently, and there's nothing historic about it. I don't know, I just always thought that was sort of funny. Anyway, my story takes place pretty late at night. Like a lot of historic towns that rely completely on tourism for their economy, this town closed down really early in the evening. From that point on, it was basically a ghost town. After 5 p.m., you couldn't find a single shop still open. I was trying to start up a YouTube channel of my own at the time, and I wanted to record exploration of abandoned areas. I figured I could film around this town when it was closed down, and I could pretend like it was a complete ghost town. I set up to do this on a Wednesday night. I figured it was better than doing it on a weekend. I drove into the town, and as usual, it was completely dead. I got my camera out. I took quite a bit of film that night. Of course, I didn't encounter anything like ghosts or anything spooky like that, but I really hadn't been expecting to either. I could just add in all the suspenseful stuff in editing. I was about to leave the town when I remembered that covered bridge. Those things have a reputation for being pretty creepy, so I decided to have a go and film around that area. The town was pretty small, so rather than drive out to the bridge, I decided to simply walk over to it. I thought maybe I could get some creepy footage along the way there. The bridge did not disappoint at all. It was extremely creepy. It was pretty small like I mentioned, it was really more there as a decoration than anything. I started recording around that area. There were a lot of trees around, and I was thinking it might be cool to edit something into the video, like an orb or some other sort of mysterious ghost. Yeah, I know that's pretty dishonest, but at least I'm being honest now about what my intentions for my channel were. After filming around the bridge, I began walking up to it. I wanted to get a good shot of me walking through that bridge, so I began walking into it. As I mentioned, it was very short and covered a small gap of the road. There weren't any lights on the inside, though. That wasn't a big deal. It wasn't so dark that you couldn't see at all, and I had the light from my camera, too. I was able to record the details of the bridge really well. As I was getting close to the far side, I was only a few steps away. When I heard a voice whisper, mid-step, Hey, he's almost here. Give me the axe. Although it was a whisper, it was completely quiet outside, so I heard that conversation plain as day. I immediately stopped walking, and I heard some rustling by the bridge opening. I saw the beginning of a figure moving into the light. I turned and forgot about my video. I ran out of the other side of the bridge. I didn't want to look back. I didn't want to know who was following me, or what they wanted from me. I just wanted to get as far away as possible. I didn't stop running until I made it to my car. I finally turned to see if the person had been following me, but there was no one there. Still scared, I jumped into my car and made the drive out of town. There's no real telling what might have happened that night if I hadn't heard that conversation. I accept the fact it might have been some teenagers messing with me, or something non-life-threatening. I mean, no one followed me, at least from what I could tell. But there's a slight possibility that there really were two people out there waiting for me with an axe to kill me. That possibility gets to me every time I think about it. Now, I don't really believe in ghosts, but I've never been able to explain this story in any way logically. I saw something that was quite frightening at an old covered bridge. The bridge was way up in the hills. 
You have to cross it on your way up to a cabin my family owns out there. The bridge itself is very old and rickety as well. It's also over a thin but very deep ravine. Even though I've crossed it so many times before, every time I get so much more nervous about it than I was the last time. It always creaks as my car crosses it, and I swear it feels like it's about to give way. But I've been going across that same bridge since I was five years old. It's always felt like that, and it's always held in place. This particular story happened in the early fall. I wanted to spend some time up at my family's cabin, because the mountains were beautiful in the fall time. It was great watching the leaves turn the hills into different colors. My favorite thing about the leaves that fell from the trees was that it always kicked up a leaf storm as well. It was an extremely beautiful sight. I'd been up at the cabin all weekend, and on Sunday evening, I had to drive to the town in order to get something from the store. As you might imagine, I was not really enthusiastic about driving down these mountain roads at evening or night. I had to drive really slow and really carefully. As I was driving, I came around the corner and realized this was the corner with the covered bridge. I could see it up in the distance. I was pretty focused on what I was doing, and I wasn't really concerned with the structure of the bridge like I normally was. It wasn't completely dark out yet, so when the bridge first came into sight, I could have sworn I saw a person standing inside of it. It looked like they'd entered the bridge from the near side and were walking through it. I thought that was a bit weird and that possibly I should offer them a ride. When I came closer to the bridge and got to the entrance of it, I saw there was indeed a person walking through the center. When I got there, he had stopped on the far entrance. He turned around and looked at me, blocking the exit. He looked right at my car, and my previous intentions of offering a ride slipped my mind in that moment. This was a bit of a scary-looking guy. He also had this huge smile on his face. I had to stop my car where it was. There wasn't any way to get past him without running him over. The bridge was only one thin lane. As I stopped there, I began to wonder what I should do. The man then started taking steps toward me though. He was still smiling. The way he walked was so creepy too. About halfway through the bridge toward me, he stopped. I'll never forget the creepy look on his face as he stood there for a moment, tilting his head and staring in at me. I wasn't sure how much time had passed with him standing there blocking the way. Then though, he suddenly walked to the side of the bridge. He pushed himself up on one of the openings on the side, turned back and smiled at me again, then just jumped off the side of the bridge into the ravine. Needless to say, I was shocked. Like an idiot, I jumped out of the car and ran to where he'd just been. There wasn't anything I could do, though. By the time I got there, he must have hit the bottom of the ravine and died already. I looked down towards the bottom, but I didn't see anything. That was not surprising in and of itself. It was a very deep area. I didn't know what to do. I don't know how long I stood there, looking down into that ravine. When I realized I still had to drive to town, only now I had to drive to contact the authorities. I went straight to the police station and told them the entire story. The police officer I spoke to seemed very disinterested. When I was done though, he looked right at me and asked me a bunch of weird questions. Finally, he told me he could go down to the ravine and look for the body, but he knew that he would not find it. He said for the past 10 years, he'd had people coming down off that mountain every once in a while, telling him that exact same story, but no one had ever been found in the ravine. I don't really know what to think of this. Was he just trying to keep me from following up, or was he serious about the amount of people who'd told him that story before? I don't know the exact truth, but I do know that what I saw that night was terrifying. I have a bad habit of walking alone at night. I love it though. I know it's not the best plan as a small woman, but it's one of those things that just gives me joy. Speaks to my soul, I guess, as cheesy as that may sound. 
I do carry pepper spray and keep my phone in my hand. But hell, if I'll let fear ruin something I love. Summer nights are the best, really. The light lingers forever in the Pacific Northwest. You get these endless twilights, and there's this beautiful breath of coolness coming out of the dense green, even when it's been hot in the daytime. I lived in the desert as a teenager, so I just love the cool, silky feeling air here. Soaking up that night air is amazing. I live in a small town at the head of a very long rural trail that winds through lowland marshy areas, dense woods, fields, and at night is silent and isolated. 99% of the time, nobody is out there in the night except for me, the bats, and a rare bicyclist. Once you get outside the city limits about a mile, there's nobody to fuck with you. There's nobody looking to fuck with you either, if you get my meaning. The only houses are sparse and far, across ravines and fields covered with blackberry cane. No street lights and no easy exit from the trail either. I put one headphone in and walked for hours and miles. I usually take a big crossbody purse with some water, my ID, and a little cash, and start while the light is just leaving the sky. I only use my phone light when it gets pitch dark. This night, I was really far out into the boonies. Just me and the maple trees. It was fully dark. Really, really deep dark then. I was cruising along listening to a podcast in one ear, with my phone light lighting up the way. A beautiful night, just soaking it in. I'd been out there for a few hours, and was now heading back. Suddenly, though, there was like this extra black patch. A big splotch of darkness moving across the trail. It took me a second to realize, that's not a trick of the light. There actually was something there. There was a black mass blocking the trail in front of me. I started to get the chills. This was not normal and this thing was between me and my home. There was no other choice, so I slowly crept up to whatever this was, and I noticed a black puddle. As I got closer, I started to make out that these were smears of blood. Not like a ton, but this was definitely blood on this paved trail. I walked closer and queued up 911 on my phone. The shadow resolved itself into a man in a big flappy black coat, now sprawled across the whole trail and surrounded by bloodstains. Hey, are you okay? To my surprise, the guy sat up. He was grimy, incoherent, and kind of chipper. Oh, I'm okay. I'm just resting. You got any water? I forked over my water bottle and told him to go ahead and keep it. He took it and thanked me said he'd scraped his foot and wandered around a bit before deciding to take a breather, which was where the blood was from. I recognized him, though. He was a local meth head. I asked him if I should call anyone, 911 or whatever. He didn't respond and just looked at me. I carefully skirted around him and quickly hurried back home. I did not have particularly warm and cozy feelings about him, having hosed off his puke from my porch multiple times. And I'd been called the <clears throat> see you next Tuesday word more than once by him. So I decided to leave it at that. A few days later, he attacked a random tourist with a machete downtown in broad daylight, nearly sliced their leg off and went to prison. So I guess I had a fortunate encounter that night. There was a period of about three years where my family took yearly vacations to a nearby state park. My dad had bought an RV from a buddy, so we'd camp out in that usually. It was really fun when I was younger, but that last year was miserable. I was almost 14 by then, and hanging out with my family was the last thing I wanted to do at that age. It was spring break, and all my friends were already going to places like Florida. I did anything I could think of to pass the time. I remember sleeping a lot, and going on a lot of walks as well. I was just bored to death sitting around camp waiting for bugs to bite me. I did meet a few girls my age, but they weren't able to hang out much. 
We'd been cramped up for about four days when I ran into this cute older guy. He told me his name was Steve and he was 19. A group of his friends had invited him along for the holiday, but they all had to leave early apparently. He'd been spending his days drinking beer and fishing. Being deceitful and immature like I was, I lied and told him I was 17. When he asked me if I wanted a beer, I accepted quite quickly. I'd never even tasted alcohol at that age, but I just wanted to look cool. We walked through a small clump of trees separating the two camping areas and to his tent. He pulled out a can of beer from a cooler and handed it to me. It tasted so bad I almost spit it right back in his face, but somehow I managed to choke it down. He and I sat down at the picnic table and continued our discussion. Although I hated it, I kept on drinking the beer. Halfway through a single can, I already had a kind of buzz going. Of course, at that time, all I knew was that I felt really good. The taste began to improve with every sip, and before I knew it, I was already drunk. By the time I'd finished the first can, Steve had popped a fresh one open and had it ready for me. I started taking bigger and bigger drinks as the minutes passed by. I could tell I'd started acting like a total idiot. I also began feeling very tired and laid my head down to listen while Steve talked at me. I guess at one point I must have passed out altogether. I remember raising my head up at one point and saw Steve standing a few feet away talking on his cell phone. I laid my head back down but woke up again soon feeling sick. It wasn't long before I was throwing up everywhere. I was so embarrassed. I kept blaming it on food poisoning and he was holding my hair back and laughing. This took place over a period of hours, but it all seemed to happen in just minutes, and this is when things started to go south. I had just finished puking and was in the process of wiping off my face when a car suddenly pulled into the camping spot. I assumed one of his friends must have returned. It was starting to get quite dark, and I knew my parents would start missing me soon. I'd left for a hike just after lunch, and now I was terribly embarrassed and just wanted to get away. In my mind, I was sober enough to get past my parents. Steve was standing at the car talking to another guy his age, it seemed. I took my chance to slip away. I said goodbye and thanked him for the beers, but he called out to me to wait a bit. He suggested I stay longer and have some water so I could sober up some more. He was talking toward me the entire time. I thanked him but said I needed to get back soon. I could even hear my parents calling out for me through the trees at this point. I turned again but only took about three steps. Before I felt someone grab me from behind, it was Steve. I asked him what the hell he was doing but he didn't say anything. I quickly realized he was dragging me to the car. The other man already had the trunk open and was nervously looking around. I began fighting to get away, but Steve was so strong. The closer to the car I got, the more panicked I became. I could hear the other man saying, hurry up, hurry up, in a rushed tone. The fear really kicked in now. I started screaming at the top of my lungs, anything I could think of. Mom, Dad, help, anything. My parents were yelling back at me now. It became too risky for Steve, and I heard him screaming some expletives before he let me go. He shoved me down onto the paved surface of the road. I expected I would soon be grabbed again. I balled up my fist preparing to fight, but when I turned, no one was there. I looked up just in time to see Steve hop into the passenger side of the car, and the car sped off with the trunk still open. A massive feeling of relief washed over me. I emptied my stomach onto the pavement, everywhere at once. My dad scooped me up like I was a feather and hurried me back to the camper. It took almost an hour for the sheriffs to arrive. They put out a bulletin or whatever it's called for the car. But that was of little help. I knew nothing about cars and I was too busy fighting for my life to get the plate number. Despite my protests, I was taken to the hospital for some testing. After I was cleared, we returned home and waited for news. 
that would be the last family vacation we'd ever go on. Sleep was hard to come by for a long time. My parents put me in counseling, which did help a lot. The doctor gave me a prescription in case of anxiety attacks, but I didn't need to use that very often. The hardest part after was dating, actually. I had a lot of trouble being alone around men. The majority of times I went out in groups. Drinking was impossible. The risk of being taken advantage of or drugged was way too high. In fact, I wouldn't drink alone with a man until my husband and I married. I'd like to leave you all with an important message. Young women have so much pressure on them these days. It's not just about being pretty. They feel pressured to grow up faster than they need to, and that sometimes leads to poor decisions like the one I made. I'm not going to preach to you here. I realize you're going to do what you want, but if you find yourself in a similar position, pay attention to your instincts. They rarely lead you wrong. Somewhere about May or April every year, I leave the shop in the hands of my cousin and take a two-week vacation in the Ozarks. Our family has a 250-acre piece of land, used for hunting mostly. In my case, I just use it as a getaway from the stresses of modern life. The area has very little in the way of conveniences like electricity. Only dirt and gravel roads lead in and out. At the end of this long road sits a hundred-year-old log cabin. This is where I spend my time. Just me, my thoughts, and the beauty of nature to keep me company. It's a routine I'd recommend everyone try out at least once. I could carry on and on about how beneficial nature is all day long, but that's not why I'm here. I want to share a strange and terrifying incident I had back in 2020 whilst I was out there. While the rest of the world were hiding away in their homes, Mark, my cousin, and I were working our tails off. Things still needed repairing, and we were the only people in the area willing to fill the demand. Without our employees, though, we were overwhelmed in no time. When Mark injured his hand, we finally threw our hands up in defeat and shut down. The world was going to have to wait until we figured out a way around the lockdowns. And during this period of transition, I decided to take a vacation. A week or two in the woods was just what I needed. I was up late one night reading, when I heard a faint crack in the distance. The sound was familiar, but I was unable to place it in the moment. I sat quietly and waited for it to happen again, but I didn't hear it once more. I went back to my book, and the rest of the night was quiet. The next day, I found myself hiking away from the cabin when I came across a dead deer. It hadn't died from natural causes, clearly. The body had been hastily skinned and butchered as well. A lot of good meat had been wasted, and it made my blood boil, not just because of the horrible harvesting. Any hunter reading this knows July is way out of hunting season. It appeared to me we had a poaching problem on this land. I snapped a few photos on my phone to send to the game warden when I got back to town. Nature would have to take care of what was left. The really strange stuff, though, started later that afternoon. I was on the porch relaxing with a beer when a very odd feeling washed over me. The woods around me had become very quiet. No birds were singing. No crickets were chirping. Nothing. Slowly, I started to feel like I was being watched. The hair stood up on the back of my neck, and the uneasiness began to weigh down on me, until I felt compelled to call out. No one moved or answered, obviously. This feeling lasted for almost an hour. Gradually, though, the tension slowly lifted, and I heard the forest coming back to life around me. It was unlike any experience I'd ever had. At dinner that night, I flipped through a book about the Ozark wildlife we had on a shelf. My visitor had probably been a common deer, but black bears and lions were also a possibility. The last two were said to be very rare in my neck of the woods, though. That said, wildlife has its own set of rules and goes anywhere it pleases. I wasn't too worried about any deer, 
but the others were very capable of killing me in a heartbeat. They also tended to be very shy of people, though. I had three days left of my stay, and I figured if I kept my eyes peeled and stuck close to the cabin, I'd be completely safe, and so that was my plan. For some reason, humans hadn't even crossed my mind, despite just finding a kill the day before. As a general rule, people are loud and easy to spot, and only a very seasoned woodsman can stay invisible in the forest. No matter the circumstances, I was determined to enjoy my remaining time. I was up early the next day as usual. I'd had breakfast and was filling a bucket from the well when another crack soon came, a second later quickly followed by a ricocheting noise. And that's when it clicked for me. I was being shot at right now. The noise was the sound of a suppressed rifle. I dove behind my truck, which was parked nearby. I was kicking myself for not recognizing that the first night. Even though silencers are not very common, I do have friends that own them, so I know what they sound like. They're used for hunting, but the practice is more common in Europe than here. Contrary to what movies might make you think, suppressors don't make your gun silent. All they do is drastically reduce the sound of the gun. The actual action of the gun opening and closing, though, still makes a pretty loud clacking noise. None of that was important in the moment, though. Once I made it to cover, the shots stopped immediately. I was unsure as to where they were coming from, and I had no other choice but to try and escape some way. I was next to the truck already, so that's the option I chose. As quietly as possible, I opened the driver's side door and crawled into the cab. I put the keys in the ignition and started the engine. I expected the shots to start again, but they didn't. I wasn't willing to stick my head up and get it blown off, though. Luckily for me, I had a straight path to the road. I yanked the transmission into gear and pressed the gas pedal with my hand. The most I could do was hold the wheel straight and hope I didn't crash into a tree. Not the easiest way to drive, that's for sure. After I got about a hundred yards down the road, I quickly peeked over the dash. I didn't dare to expose myself any longer. A precision shot with a rifle could hit me about 300 yards out without much trouble. I continued driving like this until I was sure I was well out of range. At that point, I sat up in the seat and drove as fast as possible to the sheriff's station. When I arrived, I let them know they had a crazed poacher sniper on the loose. They were a lot calmer than I expected, and far more prepared than I thought they would be as well. The sheriff called in a nearby county to assist. They got together and planned out an operation quickly and professionally. I stood a few miles away while they cleared the area piece by piece. I was only allowed in after they were sure the person had fled. In my absence, he'd shot out the windows of the cabin, and there were several holes in the doors as well. I grabbed what I needed and returned home. It was all in the hands of law enforcement now. I was expecting a call within a few days updating me, but I heard nothing. After two weeks, I couldn't wait any longer. I contacted the sheriff and left a message. They called me back to say they had yet to capture the subject, and those exact words. They had found signs of old camps, but he hadn't been seen in almost a week. Missouri law enforcement had also been notified. They were monitoring their side of the border, just in case he crossed over into their state. That was the last time I had any real information. I suspect they may know more about this than they're telling me. There are thousands of acres out there for him to hide in. If he's as experienced as I think, they may never find him. I check in every month or two, and I'm always told I'll be notified should anything change. Now that life has returned to normal, though, my cousins are planning to hunt the upcoming fall and spring seasons at that cabin. They went out to make repairs earlier this year, and they saw no signs of the guy in the area. For their sake, I hope he really is gone for good. That's about all I can tell you until he's finally found. Why he even did that in the first place, though, will remain a mystery to me until we do. Ah.
I am in university right now, but staying with my parents at their house for the summer. I was hanging out with one of my friends, and we decided to go to a party. I met this guy around my age. We were talking and having fun, but it was nothing too serious, or so I thought. We soon exchanged phone numbers and hung out a couple of times after as well, but he became incredibly clingy quite quickly, so I decided to distance myself in the hopes he would get the hint and back off a bit. Well, of course he did not. When I stopped responding, he sent me over 100 messages, with each message becoming increasingly aggressive as time went on. Keep in mind, it had been less than two weeks since we'd first met. I finally responded to one of them and told him he needed to chill out a bit. He appeared to calm down after I responded, but then he asked for a phone call. I agreed, and we talked for a while. He told me he just couldn't stop thinking about me and that I was the best thing that ever happened to him. Just a bunch of stuff that was way too intense to say to someone you barely know. I tried to let him down gently, reminding him I was only home for the summer and wasn't looking for anything serious beyond a fling. This only made him angrier though. He started yelling at me, insulting me, calling me a slut. Basically a complete 180 from what he'd been saying mere minutes ago. All of a sudden, the phone went dead silent. After a brief pause, he spoke in a quiet voice. Bitch, you better get ready, because I'm coming over for you right now. Then he hung up the phone. That was very frightening, because he knew my parents were out of town for the week already, and that I was staying at their house alone. He didn't know where my parents' house was, though, because I was always the one driving. He didn't know my friend, either so I thought he had no way of figuring it out. Again, I normally live at school in another state. Regardless, I locked all the doors and shut the blinds just in case. After a while, maybe an hour or so, I managed to fall asleep. When I woke up and looked at my phone, I saw a notification on my lock screen. It was from the Ring app, indicating there had been movement on my parents' camera. I checked, and it was him. If you watch the video, you can clearly see something in his hand. When he noticed the camera, however, he left right away. I immediately blocked him on everything and reported the incident as well. I had no idea what he planned to do once he got there. It was terrifying to realize he'd even come over when I was asleep and defenseless, completely unaware of his presence. As I would later find out, he was able to easily get my address from only my phone number. Apparently, he googled it and it returned my dad's name as the owner of the number, along with my parents' address. Since I'm on my parents' phone plan, I guess it shows up that I still live here. The revelation was horrifying, as I never knew my simple phone number could reveal my entire address. I'm just extremely upset that this kind of information is on the internet for anyone to find. Please learn from my mistakes and don't give anyone your phone number unless you trust them. I found out that you can get a free Google Voice number to text and call people, and that number can't be traced back so easily. My advice is to use a disposable number for anyone you're not sure about talking to, or that you meet informally or online. A few years back when I was around 18, I entered a very rebellious period of my life. I've always been a prodigy child, always did as I was told. Never stayed out too late, didn't smoke, didn't drink, scored the highest in all my classes. All my family, my friends, and my friends' families thought I was the perfect kid. But then, something changed. I was on a lot of medication due to my health and started going through bouts of depression. I started acting up like never before. I stopped going to school, I would stay in bed all day, and I didn't talk to anyone. Slowly over time, I started talking to strangers online instead. Initially, it was just talking to them online. I would talk to a few people until I found someone interesting. I would dedicate all my time to talking to them till they no longer held my interest. Then I moved on to the next person. 
This went on for about a year, and then I eventually started meeting these people in person as well. Most of the meetings were sexual, and I was very reckless. I slept around with more people than I'd like to admit, and regardless of my lack of concern for my own safety, I somehow never met anyone that had any evil intentions. We'd meet a couple of times, do the dirty, and that was that. That was until I met this one guy. I was talking to a couple of people at the time. I wasn't interested in any sort of relationship, just sort of hoeing around. This guy starts talking to me and asked me about my hobbies, my interests, what I do. I told him I don't smoke or drink, and he was quite shocked. I told him it wasn't that I'd never done it. I tried, but it just felt like it wasn't my thing. We talked for a couple of weeks, and I ended up talking about how I'd been going through depression, and at first he listened. Eventually, he started telling me I should try smoking to relieve my anxiety and stress. I had always turned it down, but he was relentless. After a month or so of talking online, we decided to meet. We never had any sort of sexual conversation or anything, so to me, we were just going to meet as friends. I was supposed to meet another guy as well, an acquaintance, for something I needed. I suggested to the online chat guy that we meet briefly for lunch, then he could drop me off at the other person's place. He agreed and we decided on where to go. The day we were supposed to meet, we met at a local cafe. We had brunch and I got in his car for him to drop me off at the place I had to go to. It was a good 45 minute drive or so, so I put on some music and decided to relax. About five minutes in though, he offered me a cigarette. I declined and he insisted, and kept insisting until I eventually gave in and agreed. I opened the box and there was only a single cigarette in there. I told him it was his last one and asked if he was sure he wanted me to smoke it since he would have enjoyed it far more than I. He said yes. I took the cigarette out, but I could tell that something was off about it. It didn't look like it was store-bought. Rather, it looked like it had been rolled by hand. Then again, I hadn't smoked enough cigarettes to be sure what they were supposed to look like, so I lit it up and smoked it. I couldn't even smoke half of it. It made me inexplicably nauseous. I gave up halfway through and offered it back to him. Instead of smoking it, though, he simply threw it out the window. I thought it was weird, but assumed maybe he didn't want to drive distracted or something. Thirty minutes later, I started feeling very sick. My whole body was shaking, and I was extremely nauseous. I could barely keep my eyes open. I kept telling him I wasn't feeling good, and maybe we should go to the ER instead of where we were going. He kept insisting I just relax and lay back. Everything about this now felt off. I told him to stop the car and drop me off right now, but he refused. All I could think of was pulling out my phone and calling the police. When he noticed what I was doing, he stopped the car and threw me out of it. I couldn't even stand. I sat on the roadside and called the guy I was supposed to visit. He immediately drove to where I was and picked me up, took me to his place where I threw up all over his living room multiple times. For the next hour and a half, I lay on the couch, my whole body convulsing and constantly throwing up. The guy brought me water, gave me some electrolytes, and kept insisting we go to the hospital right now, but I kept on refusing. I had no idea what I had smoked, but I was sure it was not just a plain old cigarette. I was scared that if it had been some illegal drug and the hospital caught on, I would get into trouble. I absolutely did not want my parents to find out what I'd been up to either, so I laid there, throwing up and convulsing, letting whatever that shit was get out of my system. All these years later, I'm now married to the guy who picked me up from the roadside and helped me through that insanely hurtful time. Oh, and yeah, the cigarette was laced. This story happened when I was younger and braver, and did a lot of stupid things without thinking beforehand. It's quite a wild ride, and it's all true as well. I used to work at a pizza shop down the street from 2pm until closing. I usually didn't get off until 11 or so at night because of this. 
I did have a car, but it was close enough to walk, so I mostly did that to save gas. This particular night, I was doing my usual thing, jamming to one of my playlists and very tired. I was happy to have such a good job though, and generally happy with the way my life was going. Up ahead, about a block or so from my place, I saw a pretty attractive guy in dark clothing walking around. Not with much purpose, really. He was taller than me, about 5 foot 10 to 6 footish or so, and had shaggy brown hair. The closer I got to him, the more I could tell he was really good looking. Like even in the dark of night, I could feel myself blushing a little. His features kind of escape me now, but I do remember his hair and thick eyebrows. I took an earbud out, and because I'm from a dangerous city and never really cared about stranger danger, I decided to talk to him a bit. Uh, hey, how's your night going? Oh, it's good, you know, just looking to get drunk. Oh, that I can help with. I've got a mini bar at my place. I live just down the street if you want. That was not exactly verbatim how the conversation went. During the walk back to my place, I didn't really get any red flags from this guy either. He seemed totally normal and was actually pretty nice. I was honestly thinking, wow, through sheer luck I met this super hunky guy that seems cool and fun. I was beside myself, really. We get to my apartment on the second floor. I jump into host mode and offer him to have a seat and make himself comfortable. The apartment was about 640 square feet in total, so it was pretty small. Except for the bathroom, you could pretty much see the rest of the apartment from any area inside. I headed into the kitchen and while I was pouring the drinks, I glanced back over at him out of curiosity. It was then that I noticed the first red flag. As I was asking him questions, he was more delayed with his answers, especially more so than he was on our walk there. He was starting to act kind of odd. I go back over to the couch, pass him his drink and sit down next to him. So what do you do for work? I asked. Oh, uh, I'm not here for sex. He put down his drink on the table. What do you mean? I'm not here for that either. He stood up. What you got? He asked me. His nice guy vernacular and friendly face were now gone. I was having a hard time understanding what he meant by that. I said what you got. The second I stood up, he pushed me backward. I basically got knocked off my feet, hitting the floor but not hard enough to get knocked out or anything. I jumped right back up, but he'd already grabbed my laptop and my work bag. As I started towards him, he cut around me and made his way toward the front door. I was right behind him when he made it outside. I managed to grab a hold of him, and we tussled again in front of the door. Now I shouted out, calling on help from the neighbors. It was late at night though, so no one came. Please help, I'm being robbed! The thing is, he had my laptop. Not just any laptop, I hate to admit it, but my entire life was on that computer at the time. Important photos I didn't have backed up, thousands of dollars in music programs, video game programming stuff for a development team I helped, really expensive software. It was in my mind irreplaceable. I gave chase down the stairs across the dog walk park, and as I started to gain on him, we tussled again. The only thing I could focus on was my laptop. I knew I had to, at any cost, get that computer back. That was all I cared about. Somehow, I got a grip on it. I tugged at it again. I guess he decided it was not worth all this struggle. He got up and started to take off once again. I realized he still had my work bag, which had my cell phone and my wallet in it. I ran after him again. This time, he shouted back at me. Follow me and I'll stab you again! This made me stop in my tracks as he got away. Underneath a street lamp nearby along the sidewalk, I immediately started to inspect myself. I was stabbed? No way. There was no way that just happened. Then I saw blood running down my leg. I saw blood pouring down my arm too. I saw two places where he cut me real good. I was scared, but the blood made it look worse than it was. I decided that was enough. I got my laptop and that's all I really needed anyway. I hobbled back home, got inside and locked my door. I called the cops using my neighbor's friend's phone the next day. 
and filed a police report explaining the situation, showing the stab wounds. I also declined medical services, since I couldn't afford that at the moment. In the end, all that guy got was a crappy cell phone and a wallet with like $30 in it. The cop called my friend back several days later and said they were not able to find the guy and that they would keep me posted in the future. That was years ago, so I don't know where the robber is now, but I have every electronic thing of importance backed up on multiple drives to this day. I'm a woman in my 30s who lives alone in a small house at the head of a quiet cul-de-sac in the UK. The street is a maze of roads away from the main road, which means that other than delivery guys and the occasional salesperson, you will rarely ever see anyone you don't recognize. I don't exactly know all my neighbors even. I do know what they look like though, and I at least know the area around where they live. I can recognize some of their cars, etc. This weirdness happened over the space of a few months several years back. I work from home, so I'm usually inside. Sometimes I don't have a lot to do either. The first day was one of those lazy days. It was about 4pm and I was sitting on the sofa, watching some daft shit about alien cover-ups. All of a sudden though, someone knocked on the door. I have a surveillance camera hidden in the wooden canopy above the front door, so I checked to see who was there. I wasn't expecting any deliveries, and I couldn't be bothered with any door-to-door -door person. Instead of any of that, though, I saw a woman who looked to be in her early 50s, very smartly dressed with expensive clothes and jewelry as well, stuff I could never afford. Most people around here generally couldn't afford it either. It's not exactly an affluent area. This lady stuck out like a sore thumb because of this. She looked flustered and agitated, glancing toward the back garden, before trying to look through the tiny frosted glass window on the front door. I also noticed she was carrying a dog's lead but didn't have a dog with her. As it happens, at the far side of my back garden, there were two hedges. There's the hedge that I own within my property boundaries, and a second hedge outside my boundary that's council-owned, along a small grassland where people tend to walk their dogs. I know for a fact there's a hole in that council-owned hedge, which I've reported to the council at least a dozen times over the past decade, and they've done the square root of sod all about it. Because of my hedge, I can't reach into it and do anything myself. Consequently, when I saw the dog's lead, I thought, man, shit. I bet her dog leapt through that hole. If it was a big dog, it was not getting into my garden, but if it was a small dog, it might be able to work its way through. I figured maybe I could put out some meat and help her lure it out or something. I'm a dog lover, so I wanted to help the woman if I could. When I was a kid, my own dog went missing for several weeks, and I thought I was never going to get him back. I remember that heartbroken feeling as I looked at this woman outside. I opened the door, and the woman gave me the strangest look. It was like she hadn't been expecting me to actually answer the door, almost like I shouldn't be there. To be fair, my mom used to live here instead, so maybe she was expecting my mom or something? I said hello, and she just stared at me. For 30 seconds, she kept on trying to look past me, as if trying to see someone else. Then she asked to see Margaret. I apologized and told her there was no Margaret at this address. Again, she gave me that look, only this time there was absolute anger behind it. Yes, there is, she insisted. It occurred to me at this point that I had a relative named Margaret, but she lived hundreds of miles away, and I hadn't seen her in years. Nonetheless, just in case she got the addresses muddled or something, I asked, Are you looking for my aunt? She just hissed at me. You know exactly who I'm looking for. What have you done with her? Absolutely lost at this point. I'd lived there for 20 years. I knew the name of the previous owner as well, so I knew she wasn't talking about them either. Not the names of the neighbors, not the names of people who have lived on the street in the time I'd been there and since moved away. Nobody was called Margaret. All I could do was tell her she had the wrong address. No, this is 
my address. You're lying. It was a tad alarming. She had the right address. She hadn't knocked on the wrong door. However, she clearly thought I'd done something to somebody who, to my best knowledge, had never lived there. I don't know how long the previous owner had had this house, but we must have been talking at least 30 years since anyone called Margaret could have possibly lived there. At this point, I also noticed that she'd subtly wrapped the dog lead around her clenched fist, like she was planning to hit me or something. In my youth, I'd had plenty of self-defense training, so I was not exactly scared of this middle-aged woman, but I was obviously a bit concerned about the situation currently brewing. I didn't particularly fancy getting into a brawl on my doorstep with a stranger. I was torn between shutting the door in her face and asking what she really wanted. Look, I don't know who you think you're looking for, but if you think something happened to a friend of yours, maybe you should call the police and let them sort it out. Sure enough, the woman immediately took her fist with the lead wrapped around it and tried to punch at me. She slammed her fist into my door as I closed it. I discovered she'd struck the door hard enough to crack the frosted glass window right in the middle. In fact, her hand was bleeding. It must have hurt quite a bit, but she didn't flinch or show any signs of pain. What the hell? I didn't know what to do in this situation. All I could think now was she must be on something and having a really bad trip. In my scariest voice I could muster, I told her to get the fuck back. I let her know I was calling the police, and if she was still there when they got there, she could deal with them herself, because I was not dealing with her anymore. She tried to shove her hands in to stop me from closing the door, but I shoved her back and managed to slam it closed and lock it. At that point, I stood next to the door while calling 999. While I was waiting for the police to turn up, I watched her on the surveillance feed. She moved in and out of shot multiple times, presumably to check the back of the house. I could hear her calling out for this Margaret over and over. A few minutes before the police finally turned up, I saw her kick over my wheelie bins in a rage, and then the most chilling thing happened. She walked back to the front door and stared right up into the camera. The camera was pretty well hidden, too. I'm not saying it's like a ninja or anything and nobody could spot it, but most people would only know it was there if they'd been looking for it, and most people aren't looking for cameras, right? She knew it was there. Must have eyeballed it previously. I reviewed all the footage I had from that day later, and she never made eye contact with it once, never looked in that direction. I checked everything I had as well, and she was only on camera that day. All I could think was she must have been there when the oldest footage got overwritten. While she was staring right into it, she made a throat-cutting gesture before walking off in a hurry. I headed to the window, watching her leave. She was walking like she didn't have a care in the world. The police finally showed up, took a statement, and I gave them a copy of the surveillance footage. I called a couple times to follow up, but nothing. Nobody ever called me back about it either. I won't lie, this did affect me for a few weeks. I moved the knife block closer to the door. I started staying up really late and not getting much sleep. On some nights, I was so tired I thought I was experiencing auditory hallucinations. Every time I heard the gate open, it put me on edge. I'd review the surveillance footage every day. Eventually, as the weeks passed on, I hadn't heard anything else, so I started to regain some of my comfort. I put it down to just a weird experience, but that didn't last. About four or five weeks after the first encounter, she suddenly appeared once again. It was just after midnight. I was in the living room mucking about on my phone, with the TV on low volume for some background noise. All of a sudden, I heard a car door slam outside and peeked out the front window. A dark-colored car was parked at the end of my driveway. I didn't see anyone moving about, but about a minute or two later, the front gate swung open with its heavy metallic groaning, and there was a knock at the door. Even if I wasn't involved in a blood feud over imaginary Margaret, I was not going to answer the door at that time. I checked the surveillance camera. The night vision mode was pretty shitty, but I was positive it was that woman again. I could even see the same dog lead. Of course, she must have known I was watching her, because she stared right into the camera. And let me tell you, when someone is already giving you the heebie-jeebies, the night vision makes people's eyes look soulless. 
Shut that fucking racket off and come out here now. I had the TV on, but like I mentioned, it was at a very low volume. There was no way she could hear it from outside the door. I couldn't even hear it if I walked to the hallway where the door was at. I was convinced she was mentally unwell. I called the police again. So I'm waiting and waiting for them to arrive, hoping she doesn't start trying to smash a window or something. She begins screaming and yelling, something I couldn't quite make out. But whatever it was, it was enough for one of the neighbors to come and investigate themselves. I watched the neighbor talk to her for a minute. She was still angry about something, wagging her finger toward my front door. But my neighbor was eventually able to get her to leave. He even stuck around for a bit to make sure she was gone. Sadly, that also meant she'd gone before the police turned up again. Another statement, more nothing. I caught up with a neighbor the next day and he apologized because it didn't occur to him to make a note of the plate. He told me she'd said much the same thing as she'd said to me previously though. She wanted to know where Margaret was and what I'd done to her. I was grasping for answers at this point. Even if she was mentally unwell, the fact she was sticking so closely to this story and had the right address as well made me think there was something more to this than somebody just having a breakdown. Something clicked for me. Was Margaret her dog, maybe? Did she think I'd stolen her dog through the hole in the back or something? Did she think I'd hurt them? Is that what this was about? It would be another few weeks before she suddenly appeared again, this time at 3 a.m. I began to hear a light tapping on the bedroom window. I knew immediately it was her. I could hear her saying things, but I couldn't make them out through the muffled sound of the windows. It's like she didn't want the neighbor to come out again, so she was trying to be quiet. I jumped out of bed and put on my clothes as quickly as I could. I tried to follow her best I could as she moved around outside of the house from room to room, tapping and knocking on all the windows and muttering. I could hear her whispering a few coherent words like noise and racket. I'm pretty sure she kept calling me a bitch as well. I couldn't check the surveillance footage this time because she'd spray painted over the lens. She was staying out of sight of the front door as well. I thought about calling the police again, but it had proven a waste of time so far. I got the feeling if I called them a third time and she was already gone, they were going to start accusing me of wasting their time, even if I did have the evidence. They'd not exactly been helpful so far. In the end, I waited by the front door and listened for her footsteps. Eventually, she knocked on it while I was standing in front. Is Margaret your dog or something? I called out. Dead silence. Nothing. I couldn't see anything because it was so dark. I had no idea where she was, and I didn't want to turn the lights on. I ended up standing there for who knows how long, at least an hour before the sun started to come up. My heart was going a mile a minute. Once it was bright enough, I started checking all the windows to see if I could see her anywhere. Nothing. I tentatively opened the front door and looked outside. I still couldn't see her. I grabbed something to arm myself with just in case. I can't even remember what now. I checked all around my house and the back garden. Nowhere to be found. As I was heading back to the front door, I spotted the oddest thing. The gate was closed. The gate that was physically attached to the side of my house. When it opened and closed, it made a fair bit of noise. You'd definitely hear it if someone opened it. You'd definitely hear it if someone opened or closed it when you were standing next to the front door. So, what did that mean? Did she jump over it somehow? It's possible, I guess, but I wouldn't want to try it. Anyway, I opened the gate and headed out to the end of the driveway. I looked around, no signs of her still. I turned back to the house, only to see she'd spray-painted Liar on the front and left the dog lead on the floor beneath it. That was thankfully the last time I heard of or saw this woman, but I still think she comes by sometimes. Ever since this all happened, I get these creeped out feelings occasionally at night and check out the windows. I don't know whether I'm imagining it or not, but every now and again too, I see that dark colored car out on the street as well. Not parked right at the end of my driveway, mind you but I can't shake the feeling she's there watching my house. Perhaps she really was looking for her dog and keeps thinking she'll see me with it. I have no idea what to make of all this.
First of all, English is not my first language, so I'm sorry if some things sound a bit weird. This story takes place a few years ago, while I was still with my ex-girlfriend. I, male and 22, was around 17 or 18 in this moment. I was living with my parents in a small town of about 300 people. There were three farms in this town, which included a lot of fields. We had the habit of walking out in those fields thanks to a small path which was fairly old. There was place enough for one car, truck, or tractor. It was around the afternoon, 5 or 6 p.m. We decided to go out into a field and have a picnic. We could see the road and the people on the road could see us, so it would be fairly safe. The field belonged to my neighbor, who was okay with us doing things like this every now and then. The field was also separated from the road thanks to a barbed wire fence. We smoked some weed, we drank, we listened to music and ate, and everything was going well. At one point though, we heard a car park in the middle of the road. A man got out of the car and went into the bushes. At this point, I thought someone must have stopped because they had to use the restroom or something, but I kept an eye on him just in case. I talked with my girlfriend like I'd done all afternoon until then, when I looked back at where the man was. This time, he was no longer in the bush. He was standing still, crouching behind his car, looking right at us, motionless. I didn't say anything. I looked back at my girlfriend. I was feeling unnerved. I gave another quick look, only to see the man had now moved to the other end of his car and was doing the same thing. No motion just looking at us crouching behind it. The process repeated two or three times, with him moving all around his car. I was suddenly feeling very weird. The situation couldn't possibly be normal. The guy then suddenly jumped into his car and drove away in a hurry. At this moment, I told my girlfriend to pack up our things. We were going to leave right now. She thought I was overreacting, thinking I was being paranoid because of the weed we had smoked. But still, she listened to my advice. We were back on the road, going the opposite direction the guy had gone. The road was a circle, though, with every way leading back to my house and then the main road. Guess who had turned around and was coming up right behind us in his car? That guy, now staring at us while driving. He kept driving around the road again and again, passing by us, multiple times. At this moment, my girlfriend told me I was right. We took his plate and tried to call my parents, but no one was answering. The last time, the guy passed us by. I could clearly see something was now in his passenger seat, but I couldn't tell what. All of a sudden, my neighbor came up right behind him with his truck. I stopped my neighbor and told her what was going on. She told us to jump inside, and we went back to my parents' home. My dad is a cop, so I told him the plate number, and he looked into it. The car belonged to some old grandma and was apparently stolen. A few weeks later, as I did every day, I went to take my bus to the next town. It was about a seven-minute bike ride away from my home to the bus stop. It was still dark because it was pretty early in the morning. When I left my parents' home on my bike, I noticed a light behind me. It was that same car. I don't know how he knew this was my route. Maybe it was pure bad luck on my part, but I'm 100% sure it was him. He followed me until I took a detour down a path which a car couldn't use. Only bikes and pedestrians could take it. I turned off all my bike lights and drove and... I turned off all my bike lights and rode until I got to my bus stop in the complete darkness in order to not be seen and followed by the man further. I kept doing it this way for the next two years, and I never met that man again. The worst thing that ever happened to me happened at a hotel. I was making a cross-country drive. I won't say where exactly to, because I don't really think that's important to the story. All I can really tell you is that it was on a long and lonely cross-country highway. I had been driving quite a long time and late into the night as well. There weren't many cars on the road now, and the ones that were wouldn't turn off their high beams. It was a very lonely and tired experience. 
Each passing light hit my eyes in a rhythm, almost like a hypnotist, making me feel like I was in some sort of long and painful dream. I'm one of those people who likes driving at night because I make better time, but I was having way too difficult a problem with it this night. I eventually gave in and went to a motel. It was a bit of a run-down one. I didn't even like it at first, but who knows how much longer I would have been able to drive before I found another one. It was almost more like a movie theater ticket booth than a motel office. There was this glass booth and I had to pass my credit card and ID underneath the glass. It was extremely weird. The man at the counter was kind of strange too. He kept giving me this weird look and I could have sworn he was checking me out or something. I felt really dirty. When I finally got my key and went to the room, whatever dirt I felt, I definitely washed away right away. The room itself wasn't exactly dirty, don't get me wrong, but it did have this really weird smell. I checked the bed sheets and they seemed to be clean, which made me happy. The carpet was very old though. While it may have been vacuumed, I don't think that would get everything out, so I figured that must have been where the smell was coming from. The bathroom was relatively clean too to my surprise, but something about the water smelled. At that point, I decided I was going to skip the shower instead. I got changed and got ready for bed. I thought I'd check out an hour or so of television and try to fall asleep after that. Yeah, I had been falling asleep on the road, but I always liked to watch something on TV before going to bed in a new place. I was just about to fall asleep while watching TV. When I suddenly heard a knock at the door, I made my way over to the door, stumbling because I was tired. When I looked out through the peephole, I saw a rather large and nasty looking man outside. He had to be six foot five, and I couldn't even hazard a guess as to his weight. He was visibly dirty. I can't even describe how gross he looked. I wasn't about to open the door for this guy. I did ask through the door though if I could help him somehow. Uh, yeah, the manager told me I needed to come and get you and take you to the desk. He told me there was a problem with your credit card or something. It was very fishy. This was a motel. The manager should have just called me. I asked the guy why he hadn't done so. Apparently, the main phone of the desk was broken. He informed me that I had to come out to the desk right now because there was a big problem. I wasn't going to go outside though. I told the man to wait for a minute. I went over to my own portable computer, which I had connected to the motel internet. I pulled up the website for my credit card. When I did, it confirmed the money had properly gone through. I was about to check something else when the man began pounding on the door. Sir, if you don't come out right now, I'm going to have to call the police. The man yelled at me. You'll be arrested for trespassing since you didn't pay for this room. Well, if this guy was planning on attacking me or killing me or something, he really made a mistake getting so aggressive. I surely wasn't about to come out now, and his reasoning was pretty damn stupid. I went over to the door and made sure it was locked up tight. I yelled at the man to go away because I was calling the cops myself now. His response was shocking. You called the police? He yelled back, surprised and incredulous. You really called the police? Sure, call those damn police then. All they're gonna do is arrest your ass. You're trespassing. You wanna go to jail? The only way you ain't is if you come out that door right now. I went ahead and called the police while the man was still furiously pounding on the door. Apparently, they were already on their way, as the motel attendant and one of my neighbors had heard the ruckus and called them right away. I was going back to the door and told the guy the cops had already been called. We'd see who got arrested in the end. He didn't waste any time, though. He ran off and jumped into the back of a pickup truck, which then took off right away. When the police arrived, we gave them the full story. They found the guy and arrested him. Apparently, he was an ex-con and had served time for aggravated assault and attempted murder. I found out much later during the case, he had also been wanted and charged with murdering a motel guest in a neighboring state. He'd pretended to be a motel worker and demanded a woman come out of her room because her credit card didn't go through. She went with him and he beat her badly. 
She died afterward. He was found guilty in our court and was taken to the other state. He was also prosecuted there and got a life sentence. I was going into the city for work. My company was sending me in for some training, and I was pretty excited. They were sending me to one of those high-rise hotels. I had never been in one of them before, so essentially it was an all-expenses-paid vacation to me. I had money for food and a little for entertainment as well. I was really, really excited that my hotel room was on a really high floor too. I had always wanted to be in one of those high floors of a building. When I got into the hotel, I was pretty impressed with the money that my company must have spent to get me there. I checked in and went to the elevator, and came all the way to the 50th floor. I went into my room and immediately went to look out the window. I looked out onto the city. It was Las Vegas, by the way. Anyhow, I decided to go out and spend my first night hitting the casinos. I went out of my room and got on the elevator. When I did, there was only one other person in it. I guess I should feel bad about labeling this person immediately, but he seemed really filthy. I almost thought he was homeless at a first glance. He definitely didn't appear to be the type of person who could stay in such a nice hotel. Several times, this guy tried to start up a conversation with me. I was polite to him and gave him yes or no answers to most of them. He asked me if I was going any place in particular, and I told him I was going out to the casinos for the night. When he asked if I needed someone to help show me around, I gave him a surefire no. The guy immediately stopped talking, but even though we were the only two people in the elevator, he began slowly moving closer and closer to me. I tried to ignore him, you know, pretend he wasn't there but it didn't stop him from continuing to move in. Soon he was so close to me, I could practically feel his breath. I was dying, hoping this long elevator ride would finally end. It seemed it still had a while to go yet though. Thankfully, just when I was about to lose my cool and snap at this guy or something, the elevator stopped at a floor. The guy quickly shuffled away from me, verifying he was surely a creep. Thankfully, the couple that got on stayed on the elevator, all the way to the bottom floor. No one else got on the entire time. When we got to the lobby, he followed me out the door and turned to walk the same way I did. I began walking faster, trying to get a head start on him. I was able to lose him in the crowded streets of Las Vegas. I felt a wave of relief wash over me when I did so. More than once when I was out enjoying myself, though, I saw the man appear in the same casino I was. I wasn't sure he had seen me. I wasn't sure he had seen me, and I wasn't sure how he was showing up at the same places each time. I would just try to lay low, and even go to different casinos to lose him again. I wanted nothing to do with this guy. When I'd had enough of the casino browsing, I decided to go back to my hotel room and get some sleep. I kept a watchful eye around me and was happy I hadn't seen the guy even once on my way back. Happy, that is, until I got back to the hotel, only to see him already waiting in the lobby, seated on a couch right next to the elevators. He looked up when I approached the elevator, and his eyes lit up like he was excited. I went to push the button, just checking to see how he would react. He got up instantly. It was obvious he was waiting to get back on the elevator with me, I figured he must have been following me around until he realized it made more sense to wait in the place he knew I had to go back to, the hotel lobby. Well, there was no way I was going to get into the elevator again with this creep alone. I went immediately away from the elevator and over to the lobby and complained to the desk clerk. I asked for an escort to my room. They not only got me a security guard to escort me, the guard also had a talk with the creep. He told him he was making me feel uncomfortable, and it would be better if he left me alone. He then made the man wait while he went in the elevator with me. I was there for a few days, and I did see the man again often, but he never tried to ride the elevator with me again, and he never tried to talk to me or anything.
As a note, I tend to take way too many long drives. One of the reasons is that I really don't like staying in motels. I don't care how clean it is. In my mind, it's nearly impossible for a motel to be cleanly. That's no matter how they decide to take care of it. I don't know, sleeping in the same beds and sheets that tons of people would have used, the same toilets and showers that I would be using as well. I just can't deal with that sort of thing, so I try to avoid staying out altogether. I was driving home from college to visit my parents. Normally, the drive is 14 hours straight through. I basically have to get going right out of bed, and I only have an hour or so to visit with them on arrival before going to bed once again. On this particular trip the story happens on, though, I ran into a few things that halted my progress. First thing is I got a bit of a late start, because we had a power outage in my dorm, and my alarm clock didn't go off because of this. I figured I could still make it, but I had never driven at that time. I had to go through a major city. I hit it right at the peak of traffic, my car was slowed to a complete stop at times. I had never experienced traffic so horrible, and before I knew it, I had lost three extra hours, bringing the grand total of time I was behind to five hours. I tried my best to make it up by driving fast and taking less bathroom breaks, but the time I was able to make up was minimal. I called my parents and let them know I was going to be showing up late. However, when my eyes began shutting on their own, I realized it would be too dangerous to keep driving. Caffeine was doing nothing for me, so I called my parents up again and let them know I couldn't get there until the following day. I was going to have to check into a motel. I tried looking for a chain motel. I figured at least those might be cleaner for some reason. However, I wasn't able to find one. Before it got too dangerous for me to drive any further, I picked the next one I was able to find. As I pulled up, I didn't exactly get a good impression from the place right away. I walked into the office only to find no one there. I rang the bell at the front desk and heard some noise coming from a room in the back. A man in his 40s came out from the room back there. I could tell he had been sleeping in the office. He kept looking at me in a way that made me very uncomfortable. He kept his face down toward the desk, but his eyes were looking straight up at me. He did this nearly the entire time I was checking in. I can't tell you how relieved I was when I finally got the key to my room and was able to go inside. For a motel that wasn't in a chain, the place was actually fairly large. I had to drive around to get to my room and parked right in front of it. I felt a little bit better about the experience once I got inside. It was about as clean as you could expect a room like this to be. Still, I couldn't bring myself to shower there. I hadn't brought my shower shoes that I usually used in the dorm. After I got ready for bed, I turned out the light and went to sleep. I was actually surprised how easily I fell asleep that night. I woke up a bit later, not exactly sure as to what had woken me up. I'm not one of those people who normally wakes up during the night. I tend to sleep like a log straight through. I assumed it was some sort of noise and waited to see if I would hear it again. I decided to just lay back down after a while. I slept for what seemed like a long time, but I was awoken once more. I noticed it had only been half an hour. Again, I wasn't sure what exactly had woken me up. There must have been something making some noise, but again, there were no noises when I tried to listen. I laid back down and this time stayed awake for a bit. It wasn't as easy to go back to sleep. I had been woken up twice already and was now unnerved. I'd had my eyes closed for a while when I felt something. It wasn't much at first. It felt like a movement on the bed. I figured it was nothing until I slowly began feeling something pressing down on the left corner of the bed frame. It felt as if a person were putting distinct pressure right there. I opened my eyes and got up this time. I turned on the lamp, only to see the man, the one who had checked me into the motel earlier, was in the room with me. He didn't have a weapon or anything, but he was at the corner of the bed, staring at me. He had been trying to get into bed with me. 
That was when I realized he must have been what had woken me up the previous two times. It must have been because he was trying to get onto the bed quietly. I was horrified further by realizing the man must have been in the room the entire time while I had been sleeping. I'm not really that big of a guy, but I am in decent shape, and I was angry. I jumped out of the bed and grabbed the lamp off the table, threatening to beat the guy's ass. He seemed unsure of what to do, and finally decided to flee from the room. I quickly used the phone to call the cops. The cops told me the guy had just gone back to the desk. Apparently, he'd also called the cops, saying he had an unruly guest that he needed thrown out. Turns out the guy had a previous record of doing some unsavory things, however, so the police believed me right away and arrested him. Eventually, I was allowed to go on my way. I went straight home, and I've never slept in a hotel ever again. This happened over 10 years ago, so excuse me if the details are a little bit fuzzy. When I was in high school, my friend Claire came to sleep over. We had made some plans to sneak out and hang out with some guys. Then one of them would drive us home after. We go out to our friend's apartment, have some fun, when around midnight we decide it's time for us to head back. When we asked to be taken back though, everyone said no despite previously agreeing to do so. Everyone had gotten too drunk or too high to drive, so we eventually had to just start walking back. We would make some phone calls to see if anyone could pick us up and bring us the rest of the way there. My house was a good 20 minutes away by car on the highway, so there was no way we were walking all the way back together. The friend's apartment was toward the back of the complex, so we started making our way to the entrance area. We hadn't even gotten halfway there before a car started rolling up behind us. I was 15 or 16 at the time and very naive of the ways of the world. I wasn't too concerned right then, but Claire was a little smarter than me on this night. She told me we needed to start walking faster, so we did so. The car picked up pace right behind us, Again, she told me we really needed to start moving, so we started going as fast as we could. That's when the car pulled slightly in front of us, and two passenger doors opened up. Two men jumped out. Realizing there was no walking faster to get out of this situation, she instructed me to run right now. She took off running, and I followed behind her. She ran towards a group of parked cars and jumped behind a pickup truck. For a minute, we hoped and prayed we hadn't been spotted. This is where the details get kind of fuzzy. One of them must have gotten back in the car at some point, as there was now only one of them following us behind the truck. We heard a set of footsteps quickly approaching, and she indicated we now had to go into stealth mode. The man was on the other side of the car we were hiding behind, circling the truck and looking for us. We were slowly and quietly circling on the opposite side to avoid being spotted. It was almost like a scene from a video game. We somehow managed to do two or three circles around the vehicle without being detected, and by the grace of the gods he gave up and went back to the car with his friends inside. This was our one shot to get away. She told me to run again, so we ran for what felt like an eternity. In reality, it was probably only 15 seconds though. We found the pool house area and found a spot to hide. We were hidden behind some fences and bushes, anxiously waiting to see if they discovered us. Their car pulls around to the pool house and we're biting our nails hoping they don't stop and get out. The car slowly drove away though and we realized we hadn't yet been spotted. We were safe for now. The car circled around the apartment complex though for hours and hours and hours. They were not giving up on looking for us. We were safe staying where we were for the time being, but we needed to find a way to get out of there. It was the middle of winter, and of course we were dressed to impress the guys we went to hang out with, so short shorts and revealing tops. We were absolutely freezing. Claire found a dirty, disgusting Captain America blanket that we huddled up under together while making phone calls to find anyone to pick us up. We tried contacting the guys at the apartment, 
but no one answered our calls. None of our other friends answered either. We felt completely alone and hopeless. Finally, around 5 a.m., someone answered and said they would come pick us up. The best news I had ever heard in my life. Our friend got to the apartment complex, but couldn't find the area we were hiding in. The group of men were also still constantly circling around, so there was no way we were coming out of hiding. We managed to figure out where our friend was at with a little deductive work, figuring out what building they were facing, what was in front of them, and what landmarks were nearby. We figured out where they were, and we had to make a run for it. We spotted their car and ran as fast as we could. We told them to speed off right now, and our friend took off toward the entrance. We passed the group of men on the way out as they stared behind us, and that was the last we saw of them. We made it back around 6 a.m., just in time to sneak back in without my parents ever knowing we had left. If Claire hadn't been with me that night, I definitely would have been abducted, possibly killed, or even worse. So thankfully, Claire and our friend really had our backs that night. But fuck you to the adult men we went to hang out with as teenagers. Especially fuck you to the guys who intended to harm us that night. On a happier note though, I'm now very diligent and aware of my surroundings. We washed the dirty blanket and shared custody of it for years after this encounter. For some context, I was 19 years old and had just moved to Agen to start my first year of higher education. It was Sunday towards the end of September 2015, I believe. It was already very dark in the evening, almost pitch black. I was returning after spending a weekend away celebrating a friend's birthday. I had chosen to take a late train in the evening to return to Agen in order to most enjoy the afternoon with my girlfriends. I had just arrived at the station around 9.50 p.m., and I still had to walk about 30 minutes to get home. Being relatively new to the area, it was the first time I'd ever crossed the town in the middle of the night. But in my entire life, I had never had a problem before, so I was neither worried nor afraid to walk home alone, not even in the middle of the night. Anyway, on to the story itself. As I left the station, I saw a small group of men smoking in front of it, I didn't really pay much attention to them. I put in my headphones, put on my music, and started moving toward my home. The only route I knew to get home at that time was basically a long straight line, then turn left at a park and another long straight line. Extremely simple. I was still in the first straight, head in the clouds. The lighting was still good in this area but I could see that a bit further up it started to dissipate into nothing. I hadn't planned for this, but at the moment it wasn't a problem for me. Then though is when I noticed that someone was seemingly walking behind me. He was wearing a dark gray sweater with the hood completely over his head. Well, this guy was probably just going home too. Fifteen minutes later into the walk though, this guy was still right behind me. The lighting had gradually faded, and I started to feel that something was wrong here. The stress started to build up inside me. I tried to ignore it, and stupidly started turning up the volume on my phone to focus on the music I was listening to, and try not to pay attention to this person. Near the turn I was supposed to make, the lighting was basically non-existent. I was starting to get really anxious, because the guy was still walking behind me. I started to speed up even faster. I had the choice of either crossing the park or going around it. Thinking the worst, I told myself I had better stay on the sidewalk to walk past all the houses in the city center, just in case there would have been people nearby to hear or see something in the worst situation. Out of fear for my safety, I decided to bypass this park. He decided to cut through the park, which gave him a little distance on me. Despite the darkness, I could see his silhouette in the park. I could see him turning around every few seconds to note where I was. I walked even faster to gain more distance. The more I saw him advance, the more I had the feeling he was going to end up cutting me off at the exit of the park. 
I managed to get some distance on him when my speed increased, though. I was very scared. There was no no light at all. It was extremely dark. I didn't dare to run or turn around. I was afraid he would really start chasing me then, and he would easily catch up with me. I was afraid to see how far away he was, and for him to see my fear. I wanted to remain discreet, but the anxiety was so strong I started to cry. I did everything I could not to make any noise, though, so at least he wouldn't hear that I was crying. The idea of him seeing this vulnerability scared me even more. I was afraid it would excite him or give him more power and strength, and that would paralyze me even more. It was a long five minutes as he followed me, both of us completely in the dark. The more I walked, the more I began to realize we were both going in the direction of my house. I had to think about where to go, but there was no other way I knew. The next crossroads was still far away, too. The ball in my stomach was getting heavier and heavier. I was starting to have quite a stitch in my side as well. Arriving at the crossroads, I crossed without even looking to see if cars were coming. I just went for it. The street up ahead was a little brighter, but it was still very quiet. No people, no cars. I wanted to go into a random apartment or house, any one, and pretend it was my home. Maybe I could ask for some help. At the end of the intersection, I saw another man, in his 40s or so. He was making big gestures for me to stop. I was so afraid, I tried to ignore him. I thought maybe they were together. As I passed him, though, he started walking alongside me and continued to gesture to me. As I looked closer, I saw he was gesturing for me to take my earbuds out, so that's what I did. The gentleman in his 40s then said to me, Miss, I passed you with my wife and son further down. There's been a man following you since earlier. I followed you to make sure that everything would be fine, but I saw him start running after you, so I started running too to warn you. Come on, this side of the sidewalk. I'll walk with you, don't worry. I immediately saw that he was somewhat afraid too. Without asking myself any questions, I walked very close to him and broke down in tears. He tried to reassure me, but I just couldn't calm down. I was shaking all over. Now that this gentleman was beside me, the man who had been following me the whole time who was still there, watched us and then decided to leave. It was the first time I'd seen him so clearly. The gentleman who joined me explained that he had a tobacco shop in the street opposite the station and they were just closing when I passed by. When he saw this suspicious guy, he became convinced the man was following me and meant to harm me. We sat on the sidewalk together for almost 30 minutes while I came to my senses. Then he even kindly walked me home. I guess the gentleman had thought that I hadn't noticed the guy was following me. He told me later that in the part where it got completely dark, the man had started running and was actually really close to me. The gentleman started shouting at him, and the guy following me suddenly slowed down. He was certainly going to do something, but knowing the gentleman was nearby dissuaded him from trying. For my part, I was in front and much too scared to turn around, so I hadn't noticed any of that. I remained convinced that gentleman saved my life that night. Hello everyone, my name is Lisa, and I thought I could share something that happened to me. In November of 2021, it was my best friend's 20th birthday. She decided to have a party, but since she lives in an apartment with her mother, she rented out a house in the countryside, about 40 minutes by highway from our big city. She set up everything on her own. The long-awaited day finally arrived, and as usual, she was extremely late. We decided to go and collect the keys with her mother, and a friend of my friend would come and pick her up later. Despite some difficulties, we managed to find the house, which was actually really lost in between a bunch of overgrowth, especially since it was foggy and super cold. We met the owner who gave us the keys and showed us around. The house was super huge. On the ground floor, the living room, the dining room, the kitchen, a bathroom, a bedroom, and the entrance with the staircase which went up to where there were three other bedrooms and another bathroom. I decided to put my things in the bedroom on the ground floor. The owner explained to us that she'd lived in the house with her family before, 
and they had a newer house not far from this one. We wondered what my BFF was doing. They were quite late now. We were just starting to set up the decor and everything. Eventually, the two arrived, and my friend told us that all the other guests had either cancelled or were refusing to respond. That meant there were just the three of us, with me who was particularly tired already because of health problems. My BFF's mother was leaving too. We got together, some music, alcohol, chips, etc. I was starting to have a really bad headache though. I told myself that shit must be going down in my head, so we decided to open the window at the end of the room we were in. You know, get some fresh air going. Time passed by and we started to get a bit hungry. The two of us had spotted a KFC near the highway exit, about 20 minutes away. We decided to have that and order someone to come deliver it here, except we realized that no delivery service would come to our area. I was not feeling very well, so I was staying home and going to rest a little, and they were going to go out and get the food. Before settling down, I wanted to take off my makeup and change. I took all my clothes to the bedroom on the ground floor. I got my friend's makeup remover in one of the rooms upstairs. I took off my makeup in the upstairs bathroom. All of a sudden though, I began to hear noises from downstairs. Maybe it was my friends, perhaps they'd forgotten something down there. I called out their names, but there was no answer. I told myself in my head, come on girl, you're being paranoid, it's an old house. I go back downstairs and decide to quickly tidy up the living room so it will be clean when they get back. I had a cold shiver and I realized the window was still open. I got closer to close it, only to see the latch that was supposed to keep it closed was gone. That was a huge discomfort. I felt a little inner panic. I tried to reassure myself again. Things aren't going well in your life, you're tired, shit must be making you hallucinate or become paranoid or something. I closed it. Despite myself, I still had this indescribable feeling. I couldn't figure out what it was though, so I tried to act as if nothing was happening. I hummed music in the living room and went to the kitchen to grab a knife. You never know, still. I tried to send a message to my friends, but I saw my message had not been sent because there was no network signal. I tried via Snap, Insta, everything. Nothing would go through. I was on edge now. At this point, I decided I was going to explore the house and pretend I was taking snapshots of it to my friends so it didn't seem suspicious. To this day, I don't know why that thought came to me. I did the whole house though, and didn't find anything. I told myself detective series I'd been watching must have really rubbed off on me or something. I put the knife back in the kitchen and decided to go relax. I laughed at myself a bit. I did see that things were quite a mess around here, but that was probably just us messing everything up earlier. I decided to clean up a bit. I saw my deodorant, so I put it on as well. After that, I put it on the floor next to my bed. I didn't feel like bringing it back to the bathroom, and there was no bedside table. I turned off the light and put my phone down as well. I was so tired. I closed my eyes and tried to fall asleep. I had that ultra calm long breathing like when you're asleep except I couldn't seem to sleep at all. Not very long later, I began to hear little noises from under the bed as well. As if someone was tapping on the box spring to see if I'd react or not. I was paralyzed with fear. I didn't know what to do. It was almost like dissociation for me. My mind was so terrified my body started doing things all on its own. It seems stupid, but I don't know how to explain it otherwise. It's like I didn't tell my body to do anything. It just did stuff all on its own. I heard these intense rubbing noises. It sounded like something was coming out from underneath the bed. I felt a presence right next to me, but I couldn't do anything. I was about to vomit because I was so scared. I wanted to cry, but my body remained stoic and didn't move an inch. In this moment... It seemed like an eternity to me. I could feel something moving. I felt the mattress lower on the side, as if someone were putting their knee down on it. Whoever this was got closer to me. In my head, I said to myself, This is it. It's over. I wanted to scream. From who knows where, while well, the man got closer and closer, creeping over me. 
my hand suddenly grabbed the deodorant from the floor. It's crazy. It was almost like a split-second instinct. My hand had the deodorant in tow, but the rest of my body was frozen. It felt like I was suffocating. The man got closer, to the point I could feel his hot breath on my neck. It was the worst feeling I've ever felt in my entire life. I don't know how this all happened, but in a handful of seconds, somehow I managed to shove the deodorant into his eyes. The man screamed and stepped back, and I continued to spray the spray-on deodorant into his face. Two seconds later, I was running down the hall and locking myself in the bathroom with the crappy tiny latch. He began banging on the door, shouting as he tried to break the lock. I don't know what to say except it's as if I had two memories. The memory of my brain and the memory of my body. My mind wanted to scream with all its might, call for help, to cry and hide. But my body continued to move by itself. I opened a small window of the bathroom and tried to climb outside. I started running with all my strength through the vineyards once I'd made it through, through the dark and the fog. I remember thinking to myself, this is almost like an old horror movie where they run out through the cornfield. I could hear the man chasing far behind me, but I didn't dare to turn around. I ran and ran and ran without stopping. I didn't even think about taking my phone with me. I just ran. I arrived at a house with no lights on. I wanted to call for help, but nothing would come out. I began searching around for a place to hide. I knew I wouldn't be able to run for 50 years trying to outpace the guy, and I knew he was not far away. I had to hurry. I saw some sort of old compost bin, so I opened it and jumped inside. I tried to calm my breathing. I could hear the man coming. I told myself that my friends would surely arrive soon. I tried to remember all the information I could. The name of the town, my name, the guy's height, the guy's weight, what he was wearing, what happened. I could hear his footsteps nearby. I decided to try and not make any noise. What followed was the longest several minutes of my life. Fortunately, not long later, I heard sirens coming down the street. Then the guy screamed. Even today, I remember exactly the intonation of his cries. I continued to not make any noises. I didn't know what was going on outside. I could hear his shouting and yelling, a scuffle even. I told myself it was not over yet. I couldn't be sure it was over until the cops got me. I could hear even more screaming, then footsteps coming closer to me. Now I heard people calling out my name. I couldn't move. Someone opened the door above me. It was a cop telling me it was going to be okay. Nothing came out of my mouth. I couldn't cry or say a word. It was only when my BFF came and hugged me that everything settled down. I collapsed on the ground and cried my eyes out. It was horrible. The police were able to take my testimony the next day at the hospital. Then gave me the story of what actually happened. Apparently, this guy was watching the house the whole time. He saw my friends all leave, so he decided to take his chance. He entered the house via the living room window. Then he went into the downstairs bathroom and stole my underwear. He meditated on it and then climbed under the bed. He admitted that his basic goal was to rear me. After I ran away, he was so angry that he wanted to kill me as well. We learned the guy in question was the son of the owner. He knew the house well since he had lived there, and he knew there were a bunch of 20-year-old girls there. He had already been convicted of a civil assault on a minor and received a suspended sentence for another rear he had committed. Today, I'm feeling far better. I share this story as a part of my therapy, also to raise awareness about following your instincts. Also, to express my frustration at the fact that this man was already well known to the police. I'm not calling into question the police that worked on my case though, just the systematic problem as a whole. I'm lucky to still be alive. Now I'm hyper vigilant all the time. I can hear the screams regularly in the nights when I'm asleep, and I can no longer tolerate kisses on my neck or feeling someone's breath upon me, whereas I loved it before. It's a very serious thing. My name is Elena. I'm 28 years old and I live in Belgium. At the time of this incident, I was 18 years old. 
A friend had invited me to a party. I didn't really want to go because I didn't know anyone except for her and it was an entire hour's drive away from my home. In the end though, I ended up going anyway. The evening actually went pretty great. We had a lot of fun and I stayed sober because I had to drive home later. My friend though was completely smashed out drunk. After making sure that her roommate would bring her home safely, I finally got to go home around 4am. I got back into my car all alone. It was an old 98 car that I had bought with my student job salary. The evening had taken place at a distillery in a small country road not lit at all. I was parked quite far away as well. I was already not too reassured as I walked toward my car. I quickened my pace even further though once I heard leaves crunching behind me. I arrived at my car and went to open the door with the key since it was an old car, only to realize it was no longer locked. I had for sure locked it on the way out to the party, but at least nothing had been stolen. I sat down and turned to the right to put my bag on the passenger seat, only to see out of the corner of my eye, legs in the back seat. I turned around and discovered someone back there, a girl just lying in my back seat. Terrified, I began to yell at her, asking what the hell she was doing hiding in my car. She jumped up and started to cry. She apologized and explained to me she'd come here alone by train to join her friends at this party. She had been drinking so much though that she missed the last train home and she didn't know how to get back by herself. She walked over to the first open car and decided to sleep it out there. I was a little angry, but I felt bad for shouting at her. It really felt like she was in some real distress. I told myself she was just a lonely girl who wanted to go home, like me in the end. I felt really sorry for her, so I offered to take her home. I asked her where she lived, and she told me the name of a town right next to mine. I told her I would take her back, since it was not very far away from my house. I then invited her to come and sit up front for the ride. I set off and so as to not leave any awkward blank space, I tried to make a little small talk with her. Gradually though, as we talked more, our story started to contradict itself and I didn't feel comfortable anymore. We were still driving on this dark country road, but we'd come to a part that was well lit. While driving in the lights, I noticed that this person's legs were really hairy and very bulky as well, almost like a man's legs. Then I looked down at their hands and saw that they were those of a man as well. In that moment I understood. This was a man disguised as a woman and I hadn't noticed in the darkness. My blood ran cold. I didn't know what to do, so I followed my instinct. I told myself if I started to panic and just yelled at him, You're a guy or something, he would become aggressive and that's the last thing I wanted. I was all alone in the middle of the countryside far from home, with a guy pretending to be a woman. I had no idea why either. I followed my instincts and decided to fake a small accident so neither of us would get hurt, but I still had an excuse to call the police. I drove us into a small ditch. We got out of the car and I pretended to be in shock that I'd lost control of the car. I said I was going to call the police now because the car was damaged. He told me there was no need. He would call someone who didn't live far away and would come by and help us. I dialed the police anyway though. Thank God they answered me directly. When he saw I was now talking to the police, he just ran away into the middle of nowhere. Now I was alone with my car wrecked. I was terrified. I burst into tears and explained everything to the policewoman on the line. She told me a team was not very far away and they would arrive soon. A good five minutes later, the police arrived. I was hiding behind my car, completely afraid the man would re-emerge from where I'd seen him running away into the darkness. I explained everything to them, describing the appearance of the man in question while they searched my vehicle. They opened the trunk while I was talking to an officer, and then my face fell. There was a shovel as well as a bunch of items to tie someone up in there. Obviously, I'd not had those in my trunk before. The sick man had planned to bury me in the middle of nowhere. The police took me home and explained to me I was very lucky. I never knew who the man was, and I never saw him again either. 
Clearly, though, that evening I escaped death. I asked myself 1,001 questions. He gave me the name of a small town next to mine. So how did he know where I lived? He got into my car, a single girl's car. How did he know it was that, though? Had he been following me the whole time? When he said he was going to call someone, did he have an accomplice? Since he ran off into the middle of nowhere, why didn't the police ever find him? Even today, ten years later, I still have anxiety just thinking about it. I have a phobia of going home alone, and I never let my friends go home alone either. I'm traumatized for life now. Let me tell you the story of how I developed social anxiety disorder. I used to work night shifts, so I sleep during the daytime. A few years ago, I woke up to some pretty terrible news. I had a bunch of missed calls and unread text messages from my landlord. They were telling me to call them as soon as possible. I called them up and they told me there was a leak in the apartment downstairs. One they figured was coming from my apartment. As a result, they'd shut off the water while I was asleep. That meant no shower, no coffee, I couldn't even flush my own toilet. The only consolation was that I'd found a plumber to find and fix the leak, and he'd reimburse me the money if I kept a receipt or invoice. It was already around 3 in the afternoon when I learned the news about the water being shut off, which was obviously coming up to the end of most people's working days. I knew a few emergency plumbers who might be able to deal with the problem on short notice, but all of them were too busy to take the job. I ended up calling around to a few friends to see if I could stay at their place until the problem was dealt with. Luckily, one of my girlfriends was more than willing to take me in. She also offered me a Hail Mary sort of suggestion, though as to where I could find someone who wasn't a pro but knew just enough about plumbing to be able to help. Craigslist. I didn't think it would be very much help at all. I mean, I figured most people used it to sell stuff and organize hookups or whatever, but then again, I'd never actually used the site all that much. To my surprise, there was an entire section of the services part of the site that was called Household. What do you know? Third post down said something like, 37-year-old handyman looking for some work, with the post saying he knew a little bit about everything and would take jobs on short notice at really low prices. It seemed a little bit too good to be true, and I suppose that's because it was. I gave the guy a call on the number he'd included in his post and explained the situation to him. Honestly, I expected him to give me the same sorry, too busy line that all the others had, but no. He seemed all too happy to drive out that evening to see if he could shut off this leaky pipe and go turn my water back on. I thought to myself, damn, all my prayers have just been answered. I mean, the guy even said himself it sounded like a really simple job. He was amazed another plumber hadn't come out already to just open up the floorboards, close off the pipe, and turn the water back on. Now, I knew absolutely nothing about all this, so when he said opening up the floorboards or whatever and how it was such a simple process, I just ate it all up. About an hour or so after I'd made the first phone call, the guy showed up to my apartment and told me he was outside. I realized I'd totally forgot to tell him which apartment it was. I let him know and I buzzed him in. The guy then showed up at my door, looking totally legit. I showed him into the bathroom which is where the landlord thought the leak was coming from. I then went back to my TV room and carried on preparing my very late breakfast. Remember, I worked night shifts at the time. A few minutes later, the guy who called himself Tony called me into the bathroom. Hey, uh, does this look right to you? I walked toward the bathroom, stuck my head around the door to take a peek, and that's the last thing I remember. The next thing I know, there's a bright light in front of me, and I groggily realized it was coming from the little pen flashlight of an EMT checking if I was responsive or not. I started panicking, asking what was going on. They told me to keep still while they got a stretcher up to my apartment. They put me on it and wheeled me out into the hallway outside. There was the friend who agreed to let me stay at her place. 
She was in hysterics, asking the EMT if I was going to be okay. I remember relaxing and sinking into the stretcher when I heard them say yes. I felt like I wanted to sleep for days, but when I told the EMTs I was feeling so tired, I could just take a nap while they were driving me to the hospital. They kept insisting I stay awake, to do anything I could to stay up. In the end, they kept asking me all these dumb small talk style questions just to keep me talking. Then, at the hospital, I'm pretty sure they gave me something to keep me from drifting off as well. Because apparently, falling asleep with a head injury can actually be fatal. Not long after, the cops showed up to take a statement about the plumber guy from me. They'd gone through my place and found a bunch of valuables missing. Obvious stuff too, like the TV being gone from the mount on the wall. All my jewelry gone as well, with my rooms completely ransacked. Only then did I put two and two together and realized what really happened. That guy was not a plumber at all. He hadn't even touched anything in the bathroom. He just used the whole handyman thing as a front to rob people. One of the cops told me I was the fourth person to get robbed by that same guy that month, only because he uses different phone numbers every time and never told anyone the truth about himself. They hadn't been able to track him down. As far as I know, they still haven't caught the guy. He pulled a few robberies, then quit when the public got a warning about hiring anonymous handymen on the internet. He's probably still out there robbing people to this day, doing his thing, switching it up, and not getting caught. I hope those other people he robbed and beat got over what happened to them eventually, but I didn't. Like I said, I developed a serious anxiety disorder after the attack, and it hit me in a way I just didn't expect. Bad things can happen to good people sometimes. I know that, and I took a lot of comfort in knowing the cops were at least closing the net around this guy. Then though, after I got out of the hospital, it must have been two or three days before I realized I couldn't bring myself to leave the house. I got nervous just getting food from the delivery guys that dropped it off at my apartment building. I figured it would just go away eventually, only it never did. I always got this tight feeling in my chest, an itchy feeling all over me. Whenever anyone I didn't know walked outside my apartment or outside in the hallway, sometimes I still find myself running to the people with the gun I bought, staring through the little glass circle waiting to see if the face of the guy who robbed me is on the other side. I know it's never going to be there, but I still find myself doing it. I got a nasty scar on my jawline from where the guy hit me too. The EMTs said I must have had a steel skeleton or something, because it's a miracle my jaw wasn't broken. I guess I got a lot of scars people can't see, along with a wound I'm not sure will ever properly heal. So way back when the PS3 first came out, I really, really wanted one. I mean, I wanted one bad. The main reason was because I wanted to play Call of Duty 3, still one of my favorite game series ever. Since my idiot self was slow on pre-ordering one though, I was slow when it came to the actual release date too. I remember watching eBay like a hawk, scouring Craigslist every day. Day after day went by, and I didn't have any luck finding one at all. Then though, boom, I see this one post on Craigslist that said a guy was selling his brand new PlayStation 3 and Call of Duty 3 included, both for like 400 bucks, at least $100 below asking price. The thing was, he needed to sell it ASAP, and he needed someone to drive over to him to pick it up. The person that could pay his asking price and pick up ASAP got the package. Somehow, I got lucky. Really lucky. Apparently, a lot of folks were messaging him for it, and it sounded like they were going to rob him or something. I was older than most of those wannabe buyers. I could text him a picture of the cash and drive over to the Walmart parking lot that night to be able to pick it up. I felt like a kid at Christmas or something. Granted, most kids don't drive to Santa and pay him 400 bucks to get their presents, but still, I was majorly excited. Only trouble was, the guy was working late that night, 
I'd have to drive over to the Walmart parking lot at like 2 in the morning just to pick it up. Now, I know what you're thinking. Walmart parking lot, 2 a.m., something bad was always going to happen. And yeah, I'd be lying if I said it hadn't passed my mind while I was thinking about this whole thing. I think I made myself clear at the beginning, though. I really wanted that stupid World War II game, and the amount I wanted it outweighed whatever good sense I had. And that's how I found myself in the Walmart parking lot in South Hanover way, way after dark. Like I said, there was always a chance something bad was going to happen. I just figured it would be from the other end of the law. I'm just sitting there when I heard someone tapping on the glass of my driver's side window. I saw a gun and thought I was about to get carjacked or something. They got me out of the car at gunpoint. Then though, I saw a badge on the dude's plainclothes belt. Honestly, I breathed a sigh of relief at first. I knew my reason for being there sounded sketchy. Picking up a PlayStation 3 at 2 in the morning would have sounded really sus if I was a cop. Then though, they pulled the $400 in cash out of my wallet and said they were confiscating it as suspected earnings for drugs. I started to get real angry. I told them to search my car for drugs or guns or whatever they were looking for. If they didn't find anything, they had no right to take my money. One of the cops smirked when I said that though screaming in my face and threatening to beat me. His partner had to calm him down, like he was legitimately worried he was about to punch me or something. The angry cop walked back to their unmarked car, and the other cop wrote a ticket for the cash they took. While he did that, he apologized for his partner and promised if I brought some pay stubs to the precinct, I'd get all my money back, no problems. I was angry I was probably going to miss out on the PlayStation but I figured these guys were just doing their jobs. Getting it taken by the police was at least much better than getting straight up robbed and carjacked by some random dudes that wouldn't have been so reluctant to beat me down. I drove over to the precinct first thing in the morning with some pay stubs, which I figured would prove the money was mine. I get there, ticket in hand, and some cop walks out with an evidence bag with my money in it, only right as she puts it down in front of me, I tell her there must be some kind of mistake. I told her the cops had pulled me out of my car and took exactly 400 bucks off me, but in this bag there was no more than a hundred. She then shows me the ticket and the little box that listed confiscated items. It said a hundred instead of four hundred. Right then it was my turn to freak out. I couldn't believe they would do me like that. I started demanding complaint forms, numbers to call, all that. The lady just thought I was sizing up the amount but I swear to God it was more money than that. She gave me the number to call to register a complaint, which I did. I know, I know. Cops taking bribes around Baltimore is probably only raising eyebrows with the most naive of you. Missing out on the PS3 wasn't the scary thing, though. The scary thing was coming home from work three days later and seeing a car I didn't recognize parked right across the street from my house. I didn't immediately assume anything bad. I just wondered who in the neighborhood had gotten themselves such a nice new set of wheels. And that's when I saw him, though. The same plain-clothes cop that wanted to tee off on me that night. The same cop who'd stolen my money. He just looked me dead in the eyes and smiled before driving off down the block. It was like a warning or something, just to tell me he knew I'd made the complaint. If criminals or gangsters do stuff that shakes you up, sure. But it makes sense. Those Johns are supposed to rob you or shoot you or whatever, but when it's the cops doing it, the same people who are supposed to protect you and you're supposed to turn to, that's really terrifying. Back when I was about four or five years old, me and my mom went to stay over with my grandparents for the weekend. My dad had left before I was even born, so it had always just been me and my mom. My grandparents were also a huge part of my life growing up. We'd go over on a Friday night, then stay till late on Sunday, mainly so my mom could have a social life or work the long weekend shifts at her job. So, this one dark Sunday evening around the holidays, I remember getting carried out to the car. I was half asleep already. 
I don't even remember driving off, because I must have been out like a light the moment I got strapped into the car seat. Next thing I remember, though, I felt cold on my face. I could hear my mom crying and begging someone not to hurt her, because she had me in the car. I remember looking outside and seeing what I thought was a monster at the time. But what I later learned was a man in a bunny mask. If you've ever seen that slasher movie, You're Next, it was kind of like that. Not just some flimsy plastic thing. It was super detailed and really creepy looking. The guy's partner had basically stood in the middle of the road with his car at the side, like he crashed or something. When my mom pulled over to help, he put on a ski mask. His partner appeared with a bunny mask on, and then proceeded to rob us before doing something unspeakable to my mom. It almost killed her. I mean that both literally and metaphorically. She spent two weeks in the hospital and I ended up living with my grandparents for almost a whole year because she was in and out of various institutions. It messed her up that bad. I hardly got away scot-free either. I had nightmares about a bunny monster chasing my mom for years afterward, and that image was burned into my retina. But like with most things, time is the greatest healer, and as I hit double-digit ages, things eventually got better and we started to live something of a normal life again. Cut to me being 24, still living with my mom, looking for an apartment to move into because I got a decent paying job with my college degree. The place came unfurnished, so I was looking for cheap furniture and decor for the place. One of the first things I started looking at was Craigslist. In the for sale section, I started seeing some pretty sweet looking items at bargain bin prices. So I contacted one of the sellers and discovered it was some guy's granddaughter selling off a bunch of his stuff to pay for a care home. The girl seemed really nice and even promised me some kind of discount if I bought a bunch in bulk. We arranged for me to go over to her grandpa's place to check out some of the stuff before I handed over the cash. This one Saturday afternoon, I drove over to the house to start haggling. She introduced herself and was really sweet. But when I saw her grandpa, I realized why they needed the money for a care home. He was in a really, really bad way. I don't know exactly what was wrong with him because I didn't ask much questions about his condition. But you could see it was real bad. He couldn't move at all from his wheelchair. He had an oxygen tank and barely even reacted to meeting me. You could just kind of visibly see he didn't have too long left. I checked out the three main items on my list. A closet, a desk, and a dinner table. Me and the granddaughter agreed on a price for them. I obviously had to arrange a U-Haul to go pick them up and all that stuff, but I figured I could arrange for the following weekend, once we'd confirmed the purchases. Once that was done, me and the granddaughter had some coffee together, and she explained that almost everything in the house was for sale. Apparently, her grandpa had been something of a wild child in his youth, in and out of jail, Although he'd led a much more regular existence after his final stint in jail, he hadn't got a lot saved up for a rainy day. It was a real sad story. The girl went on to explain that everything in the garage was for sale too, if I wanted to take a look around in there. At this stage, I figured I'd buy a few more things from them. Maybe stuff they wouldn't be able to sell easily, knickknacks or whatever. I could decorate my apartment while the money went to what I considered at the time to be a worthy cause. We finished up the coffee and the girl went to help her grandpa out with something. I headed out to the garage to check out all the stuff they had piled in there. And boy do I mean piled up. There was a literal mountain of garbage in there. But some stuff I figured I could make a home for. I'm talking stuff like old cookie jars, books, weird ornaments, all kinds of things. I started digging through this pile of stuff, placing some of the items I considered buying to one side, when suddenly I spotted something that made me freeze in place. What had obviously once been bright white was now dirty gray-brown. All the paint in the eyes and the mouth was old and peeling, but surely I recognized what this was. It was something I'd seen in hundreds of nightmares I had as a kid, something that traumatized me and my mom for years. It was a bunny mask, of the exact same design as the one worn by the guy who'd almost taken my mom from me. I remember looking at it for a few seconds, then kind of stumbling away in complete disbelief. 
I told myself there was no way it was the exact one. But then I started to piece it together, how Grandpa had been in and out of prison, and it started to make a horrible kind of sense. I tried to pull myself together. I think I did a good enough job of it to just bundle up what I'd pulled out of the trash pile before carrying it into the house to talk. I put on a fake smile and paid for the stuff, then tried to make it sound as natural and innocently curious as possible. When I asked the girl what her grandpa had gone to jail for, she was kind of taken aback and didn't know exactly. She just knew we didn't talk much about it, and neither did her mom. So she figured that whatever it was, it must have been something to be pretty ashamed of. I asked if I could go into the room with the guy to thank him personally, insisting when the girl said he might not really be able to hear me, and if he did, he probably wouldn't respond in any way. I said it was okay, still maintaining my composure, and insisting I go into this room to thank him. By the time I got to the guy's bedroom door, my hand was shaking though. When I walked in, there he was, sitting in his wheelchair, not even looking to see who'd just walked in. His granddaughter had positioned him in front of a TV, but he wasn't really watching it. He was just kind of staring into space. I sat down on the bed near him, arranging my thoughts at first. I asked him something like, where were you living around December of 1987? It obviously didn't get so much as a nod from him. He just kept his empty stare fixed on the wall. I wanted to get up and leave, wondering if my questions would just confuse or upset a sick old man but there was a part of me that wouldn't let me leave without asking him the other questions. I was hoping he'd say something, anything to me about that mask I'd found in the garage. As it turns out, though, I didn't need his words to know he could hear me. I asked him again, Did you rob a woman with a kid in her car around Christmas time of that year? Nothing moved but his eyes, which moved up from the spot he was looking at as he began to stare at something else. This time, though, he clearly was not staring into oblivion. It looked like he was remembering something. I told him his granddaughter had told me he'd been in and out of jail, and although he hadn't told her exactly what for, I thought I had a pretty good idea of what it was. He stayed quiet, but his body began to tremble, almost like he was trying to say something but couldn't. What I said next was basically a lie. I whispered in his ear, I know it was you. His reaction confirmed it in my head. He had no way of effectively communicating, but I could see his eyes were filled with regret. They started to tear up. Maybe not being able to talk was beginning to overwhelm him. At least I figured that was what his reaction was. I don't know if he wanted me to tell him to go kick rocks or if he wanted to say he was sorry or what, but I didn't care at that point. I just had one more thing to say to him before I got up and walked out. You almost ruined my life. You deserve to be in that chair. He actually let out a kind of whimper as I stood up and walked out. When the guy's granddaughter stopped me to say thank you, I disguised what I was feeling by telling her myself and her grandpa had shared quite an emotional exchange of gratitude. I guess she thought it was kind of sweet. I honestly hope she never found out the truth. After getting back into my car, I only made it about two blocks before I pulled over and started bawling. I was filled with doubt. Like the thing that got me crying was the idea I might have seriously distressed a sick old man. But the other voice in my head was saying, that's him. I know it was him. When I regained my composure, I drove over to my mom's place to tell her all about it. And we both cried together. When she said she also thought it was the same guy, I asked her if anyone was caught for what happened to us. She said yes, but they were sent to jail as a result. And she had to appear in court to testify. That's part of the whole reason I was staying with my grandparents during that period. The whole court appearance thing just weighed so heavily on her mental health. I actually had no idea anyone was caught for it up until that moment. I was always under the impression those guys had just gotten away, and I grew up knowing better than to bring it up with my mom either. I mean, I still wouldn't have ever really spoken to her about it if it wasn't for that chance encounter. Part of me wondered if she'd even really believe me. It was only when I described what the guy looked like that it actually clicked for her. At first, she refused to believe it. It just seemed like perfect karma for the guy, like too perfect an end to a story. I don't believe things like that happen very often in life. In the months that followed, it felt like a great weight had been lifted from our shoulders. Nothing could ever change the past or undo the trauma we both experienced, 
but knowing the guy was suffering in such a way was like proof there really was a god. I know that might sound a little bit unhinged, but I can't really think of any other way to phrase it. I guess I still don't quite believe in happy endings, and I still think the world is a cold, cruel place, but I know from experience there's such a thing as divine justice. Before I really get into this, I want all of you who are about to hear my story to know that I am a decent man. I care for and about other people, but we all get down on our luck sometimes. When this took place, I was a single father, on the verge of losing my home. My wife had died recently to cancer, and my two children really needed me to be that strong, stable parent. They knew would never leave and always take care of them. When my wife passed, I dove headfirst into a horrible depressive episode. I stopped eating and I couldn't bring myself to go into work. This, of course, resulted in me being fired, and at one point or another, Child Protective Services was called. The threat of having my children taken away from me was very serious and absolutely terrifying. I knew my wife would have been disappointed in me if she could see me now. And frankly, I was disappointed in myself as well. After losing my job, all the money I'd saved began to drain very quickly. By my fourth month of unemployment, I found myself shoplifting bread and lunch meat from the store just so I could feed my children and make ends meet. I'd stopped making payments on the house, and the bank told me they were going to foreclose if I didn't pay everything within a month. I tried to get my job back, but they pretty much wanted nothing to do with me. Finding a job was hard in those days too. It was around 2009 and I looked everywhere. On top of possibly losing my home, I had CPS telling me that without my job and certainly without my home, my children would be taken away immediately. Placed with people who could house and care for them properly, seeing as I would be considered an unfit parent. I was not about to let anyone take my children away from me, so I did what any desperate man would do to keep his children. I robbed a couple of bars. I know that sounds insane, but at the time, I had nothing left to lose. With the threat of losing everything looming over me at all times, I had to do something. I made a plan to go to this upscale bar, only a couple of cities away, and get whatever small amount of money I could. I knew there would be threats involved coming from my end, but I was never going to hurt anyone for real. Eventually, the day finally came. It was the middle of summer around noontime, a time when I figured not too many people would be there. I had a knife on me and brought a duffel bag to put in whatever small amount of money I managed to get. I parked my minivan directly outside the double doors of the small building and entered quickly. I brandished my knife and screamed at everyone to get down and stay calm. The screams were immediate. I could see the terror on these people's faces. The worst part, though, was that I hadn't realized this wasn't just a bar. It was a restaurant, too. My original plan had suddenly turned into traumatizing multiple children I had no idea would even be there. In my haste, I had overlooked a portion of researching that should have gone into planning out such a robbery. The place had bar in the name, though, so I figured it was that and called it. In the moment, though, I couldn't let these small details bother me. I'd come in with a purpose, and it wasn't like I could just back out now. I instructed everyone to take out their wallets and put whatever cash they had on the tables closest to them as well as any watches or jewelry of substantial value. I rushed to the register and threatened the worker to open it, or I would hurt someone in the room. She did what she was told, and I pulled out whatever money was within. I collected all the loose money and valuable from the tables, and quickly exited the bar without a single person trying to stop me. The only issue was, after counting up the money and pawning off the jewelry, I'd only made out with around $3,000, and that wasn't going to be nearly enough. Eventually, I saw it on the news. The story broke about a robber, but no one ever came to my door and arrested me. I figured over time, maybe I was in the clear. I knew I would have to do it again, too. 
This time, I did much more research in the bar I'd be hitting. Made sure there would be no children, and not as many people either. The bar was about an hour away, and not quite such an upscale place. I parked my car with my supplies, and headed out while the kids would be at school and people would be at work. It was around 1 in the afternoon or so. When I entered the bar in a ski mask with knife in hand, I honestly thought this would go just as smooth as the last time. Of course, nothing ever does. The first thing I noticed was the rough crowd in the place. Large men who looked like bikers, and people who had clearly been through a lot in their lives. I'd be lying if I said that I wasn't scared. I knew there was no backing out now, though. I went up to the register, and the worker didn't hesitate to give me the money inside. That's when I felt it. A sharp pain began to burn with each small step backwards I took. I looked down and saw multiple stab wounds and a knife sticking out of my stomach with a man grinning next to me, still holding the handle of the blade. He was clearly proud of himself for what he had just done. Instinct told me to pull it out, and when I did, the blood started gushing. I knew if I didn't get out of there, these people would kill me. I quickly began making my way to the front door, but I was being pushed and attacked all along the way. I remember swinging my knife at these people, but I didn't think I actually made contact with anyone. I was able to make it out and into my van, with the stab wounds being my only injury. I knew I couldn't go to the hospital though, otherwise the police would know I was the one robbing these bars. I pulled up to a drugstore and grabbed some bandages and rubbing alcohol to clean and hopefully seal the wounds to stop them from bleeding. The pain was incredible, and I thought I was going to pass out a few times, but I managed to push through it. For the next month, I couldn't even walk without any pain, but I was able to keep my children and find a job soon after. I'm grateful the wounds didn't turn into something more serious. I did end up finding I'd accidentally stabbed someone in the bar during the scramble to get out of there. It was a superficial wound though, so thankfully he recovered just fine. I felt horrible about it at the time, and I still do to this day. My kids are grown now with their own families, and I don't recommend anyone go down the route I did, but it felt like my only option at the time. I know this whole story makes me seem like a terrible person, but ask yourself, what would you do to keep your children? Desperation makes you do crazy things, and I would do it again in a heartbeat. I had my first real boyfriend when I was in high school, and we stayed together all the way till uni, when we both started working. A few months into both of our first jobs, though, we started drifting apart and getting into plenty of arguments. We didn't call it quits quite yet, probably because neither of us really had the heart to. As I started getting to know my colleagues, I found myself spending more and more time with them and less with my boyfriend. Part of my group of colleagues was an older guy. I was 20 and he was 37. He was pretty good looking, serious, and quiet, probably because he'd also just joined the company. One day, he started messaging me for work-related stuff. Then we started talking about other stuff, Pretty soon, we chatted quite frequently. I would say there was mild flirting, but really was just getting to know each other. My relationship with my boyfriend never improved, and one morning before work, we decided to break it off. I was super distraught at work, panicking and realizing I wasn't quite ready for things to end yet. My colleagues decided to take me out after work for drinks to calm me down, and I did drink quite a lot. I'm not really a drinker usually either, so getting drunk is pretty rare for me. Obviously, I couldn't drive in this sort of condition, so the older guy volunteered to drive me home. Everyone else started to leave, and soon it was just the two of us in the bar. I told him that I wanted to leave as well because it was getting pretty late. Actually, I wanted to go home and talk to my boyfriend about getting back together. He convinced me to stay and drink a bit more though, which I stupidly did. The rest of the night remains a haze, as I don't really remember what happened after. All I know is the next morning, 
I woke up in an unknown motel, naked and next to the older guy. He woke up with a smile and began to tell me dreamily about how passionately we'd made love last night, and so on. I was filled with horror. I couldn't remember anything from the night before. All I could remember was crying the whole night. I recall repeatedly telling him I wanted to go home all night too. It's all just a frustrating blur though. I started crying and he panicked and drove me back to my parents' house. Before I climbed out of his car, he leaned over to kiss me on the lips, but I avoided him and rushed out. A few minutes later, I received a text from him telling me how much fun he'd had and how in love with me he was. I was super creeped out. I told him I wasn't ready for another relationship, but we could stay friends if he liked. I was really young and naive at that time. After that, he would text me multiple times a day, even during work hours, telling me how much he loved me. I tried my best to avoid him, but I hadn't told anyone about what happened, so I couldn't stop him from coming along to our colleague outings. I began to dread those as well, because he would always try to sit next to me during meals or meetings, and quietly slip his hand under the table and stroke my thighs or crotch. Once, when it was just the two of us in the office elevator after work, he suddenly pushed me against the back wall and started kissing me and squeezing me, stopping only when I pushed him away. Looking back now, I don't know why I didn't just leave or tell somebody. I was really young and it was my first job. I didn't want people to know that I'd slept with this stranger at work. I was stupidly conscious of being labeled something. This goes on for a few months and I never did anything while he continued. I reconciled with my boyfriend and we moved back in together. I never told him about the stuff with the older guy. When the older guy found out I was back with my boyfriend though, that's when shit started to get real crazy. He found out where we lived and I would catch his car across the street most nights. He would just stay in his car outside all the way till morning. On weekends when we went out for meals, I would see his car parked outside where we were eating or suddenly notice him seated behind us in the same cinema. He even followed us to church once. That one still gives me chills because I had not expected that at all. He seemed to appear in the most random places, so to me it felt as if I could not escape him, either at work or outside of it. I was constantly looking over my shoulder, but I never confronted him because I didn't want my boyfriend to find out. The older guy kept telling me about how passionate I was during our night together. I became scared that maybe I really had acted that way. I didn't want my boyfriend to find out and leave me, although I was pretty sure I was too drunk to be anywhere near as enthusiastic as he described. His messages and phone calls became more frequent. I was so scared of the whole thing coming out in the open, I would reply to his texts and calls which mainly consisted of him breaking down on the phone, demanding I leave my boyfriend. I found out a few weeks later I was pregnant with my boyfriend's child. Of course we were happy and decided to have a small wedding. When the older guy found out, he became convinced the child was his and he started cornering me at work. He told me he would marry me and he was already planning to get a new home for us. He had the perfect name for our child, etc., the final straw was when he showed up suddenly at my front door with a ring, hysterical about marrying me. I was really scared, but I managed to put him off by telling him I really would think about it. The incident really freaked me out, so I decided to tell another male colleague about all of this. He went to talk with the older guy and threatened him to stop that bullshit. I couldn't take the pressure of dealing with it though, so I decided to quit my job. That didn't stop him from still messaging me and showing up everywhere, including my home. Thankfully, we moved to a new place after our wedding. I took the opportunity to change my phone number as well. He resorted to emailing me poetry and long emails about wanting to get together, but I was so far removed from him now I could just ignore him. After a while, he seemed to finally give up. My male colleague later informed me the guy had decided to migrate to another country because he was so heartbroken. Not like I cared much. Life went on after that. I had my child who I loved to death and a fulfilling marriage with my boyfriend now made husband. 
That was until I attended my former colleague's wedding, and there he was. I felt my heart drop to the floor, but tried not to show it because I had my husband and child with me. We were seated at the same table the whole night, and I caught him staring at me the entire time. The worst, though, was when I left to go to the bathroom and returned to see him cradling my baby in his arms. He had asked my husband if he could hold him and kept snuggling against my child. I quickly snatched him back away and told my husband I wanted to leave early. My husband did ask who the guy was, but I brushed him up by telling him it was some colleague I never really spoke to at work. Nothing happened after that until I suddenly received a text message a few days later from a random number asking how I was doing. I asked who it was and I got a reply telling me it was him. I ignored the message and the next day changed my number again. I still received random emails and texts from him though for years. I've changed my number extremely frequently, but besides those messages, thankfully nothing else has happened. It's been a few years now since the very last one. I do get nightmares every once in a while of him suddenly appearing again. I get so paranoid about him showing up I check random cars while I'm out and about sometimes. The most recent thing I heard about him was when my male colleague messaged me a few months ago to let me know that the guy had been scrounging around trying to ask if there was still a chance of us getting back together again. I wish I could somehow erase that nightmarish year out of my life, but what's done is done, so I hope he just stays away forever. For context, I'm a tiny 24-year-old woman, and I live with my boyfriend in a very small apartment complex, maybe about 30 units. It's a pretty safe town, too. We've been there for almost two years now. This story takes place late October 2017. Also important, my designated parking space is the farthest from the entrance of our complex, and it borders the back gravel lot which is for visitors or residents who don't have a designated space. And that's the area where my boyfriend parks because we only got one to share between each of us. The back lot is to the left of my space and the space to the right of me is a vacant slash unassigned one and has been for over a year. A few months before this story takes place, a white van had periodically been parking in that vacant space to the right of me. It was never consistent, though. They would usually park in the back lot, or in one of the four marked visitor spaces instead. It had become increasingly frequent, though, that they would park right next to me, even when there were closer spots that were also vacant. It was a Sunday, I believe, and I'd just gotten home from getting my hair cut. I pulled into the parking lot, and noticed a charcoal gray sedan with heavily tinted windows in a vacant spot next to mine. The car was running as well. I found this quite odd. There were several designated and visitor spots open, and I'd never seen this car before. As I was pulling into my space, the car shut off. I'm naturally cautious, so this seemed very odd to me as well. I was listening to Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon, so I decided to wait and finish the song I was on to see what would happen. Especially since I couldn't leave such a good song unfinished. Mostly though because I felt really anxious and I had the feeling I was being watched. I tried to reason to myself that perhaps they were waiting for someone else. I know I have a tendency to be paranoid. I needed to collect myself before leaving and figure out what was going on. After the song, I turned off my car and hurried inside, where my boyfriend was waiting for us to get ready to go meet his family for his brother's birthday outing. We were in our apartment for about 20 minutes while I changed clothes. We walked out to the gravel lot where his car was parked, when I noticed that the charcoal gray car was no longer next to mine. Instead, it was now next to my boyfriend's car, and it was once again running. At this point, I mentioned to him how odd it was they were still here and had moved to that different part of the lot. We went out for a few hours, and the car was no longer there when we got back. The next day, I had off from work. I got in my car to go pick up groceries, 
only to notice there was a note on my windshield. I immediately began to shake. Somehow, as I grabbed it, I just knew it was from those people in that gray car. I was so panicked I almost couldn't fully read what they wrote to me. I just started to tear up as a fear response. I won't quote the entire thing because much of it was very graphic, but here's the part I will share. Hi, you must not remember us. At approximately 5.32pm on the 29th of October, you pulled up next to us. Although you appeared pensive or preoccupied, we just couldn't help but stare. We're very serious about pleasing others, and we would be honored to be the ones to train you. They shared some incredibly detailed plans, which I didn't ask for. You can guess what they probably were. I was able to compose myself and went to pick up groceries, then called my boyfriend. He came home for his lunch break and we emailed our landlord. He went back to work and I spent the rest of the day in shock. I felt so violated. This is my home. This is supposed to be a safe place, and those strangers violated that. I don't shame them for their kinks, but this was not the way to go about them. They came to my home. They painted a picture of me and them I didn't want. They gave me a reason to be paranoid and afraid they would make that disgusting picture a reality. It took a few days, but I did call the police. They came up to our apartment and I told them my story. They collected the note that was left. They ended up calling the creeps, but I never heard back. Interestingly enough, I never saw that white van that used to occasionally park next to me after that either. I was so surprised. I didn't expect the police to take this seriously at all, because some of the other things I'd heard out there, I didn't expect the fully caring response they gave. My boss changed my schedule up so I'd get home when it was still light out and I called my friends or boyfriend every time I walked to or from my car for weeks. It was difficult to write this post, and I'm holding back on sharing the full extent of how I felt. What I do know is, it's strange they were parked next to me with all those open spaces. It's strange they turned their car off whenever I parked. It's strange how they always move spaces to follow us. They left enough info that I was able to look them up on Facebook, I had one mutual friend with this guy, surprisingly, who was an old heroin junkie co-worker. I immediately blocked and unfriended him, and blocked the other guy as well. It's been quite a while since that incident, but I'm still vigilant when walking to our apartment. The most unnerving part, aside from the graphic plan, is the fact that while I was still composing myself in the car, they must have seen that. They made it very known they were approaching me, and that they knew it made me scared. I'm glad I sought help, though. This happened around 10 years ago in 2008 or 2009. I was visiting my grandmother in a rural section of the Ozarks, near a small town with a hilarious name where I went to high school. I was very familiar with the area, and when visiting my grandmother, I would often walk into town, taking backwood trails until I reached the main road into town. Very rarely, someone would stop and offer a ride, and normally I would accept. It's a small town in a rural area where everyone mostly knows everyone else, so I wouldn't even look up until I was getting into the vehicle. I stopped accepting rides after this incident, though. I had just come out of the woods as I was walking along the side of the road. I was maybe a mile or two out of town, really enjoying my walk, when an older blue Ford Taurus pulled up next to me. The driver rolled down the passenger window. Need a ride? I heard. I started to walk over. I got in and got a good look at my driver. The man almost looked like a greasier version of Charles Manson or something. Flat, stringy brown hair that looked like it hadn't been washed in over a week that came down to his jawline. He had a salt and pepper five o'clock shadow and piercing blue eyes. Something about this guy was ringing every alarm bell in my body. I went to get back out of the car, but we were already in motion. Instead, I began to look around the vehicle. The front was relatively normal, even clean. The back seat was covered up with a blanket, though. 
On top of the blanket was something that took up nearly the entire back seat, wrapped up in a tarp. Whatever it was stood about a foot and a half off the back seat. On top of it all was a big black shaggy dog that was staring right through me. What are you doing here? The question snapped me back to the front seat. I'm sorry, what? I asked. He was staring at me instead of the road. What are you doing here? Oh, uh, I'm visiting my grandmother. I live in College Town, about 90 miles from here, and I'm on my way to see some old friends. A big frown came over his face. No, why are you here? I frowned a little. Everything in me was flashing to get out now. Uh, I just told you. My tension was rising visibly. The dog began to growl at me from the back seat. Now we were passing the sign for the county line. There was a gas station coming up that marked the beginning of the town. He was still staring at me though. Why are you here? Why the fuck are you here? He began to scream over and over at me out of nowhere, slamming his hands against the steering wheel. I huddled against the door shaking. He pulled into the gas station. Give me your glasses. It was a statement, not a question. No emotion either. I just handed them over as he told me to wait there and went into the store. I was frozen in place, shaking and trying to will my arms or legs to work, trying to start my breathing again too. I knew whatever the hell was going on here, I needed to get out right now. The dog growled at me again and that snapped me back into action. I got up almost rolling out of the car. I walked into the store shaking, and in an equally shaking voice, I said to the man, This is close enough to where I'm going. I'd like my glasses back now, please. My eyesight is very poor, but I could feel the intensity of the glare he was giving me. I think the cashier could, too, because she took a couple steps back and grabbed the store phone. He silently handed my glasses to me and continued to stare daggers at me as I put them on. Then he walked out the store without saying a single word to either of us. The cashier looked at me, clearly freaked out. What the fuck was that? She asked me. The adrenaline of the situation started to wear off and the real gravity started to sink in on me. Tears began to silently fall down my face. I asked her to use the phone. She nodded and handed it to me with a box of tissues. She told me I could go to the manager's office to make my phone call and take as much time as I needed. I thanked her, went back, and let my friends know what just happened. I also told them I'd be cutting through the woods to get to them because I didn't want to see that guy ever again. I would be coming out from behind their house. I took a few minutes to breathe and relax after I hung up. When I went back out, the cashier asked if I was okay and if there was anything she could do for me. I thanked her again and told her no. I asked if she knew the guy. Apparently, she had never seen him before and didn't think he was from the area. That shook me even more. I gave her my friend's phone number and asked her to call them if he came back. I left and cut through the woods to my friend's house. We had a great afternoon, actually, and when I was ready to leave, they gave me a ride home. At the time, I tried not to let it bother me as much, but the longer I've had to think about it, the more curious I am about what was in the back seat. The dog wasn't moving from on top of it unless the guy told him to. I try not to think about what was underneath that tarp too much. It looked just like how someone lying in the fetal position would look like from behind. When it comes to schoolwork, well, I've had some traumatic experiences in my life, and as a result, it kind of makes me feel off. I just can't seem to focus at all when I'm home, even when it's very quiet. Every little thing bothers me, and I feel like I read the same line a million times over and over. In my sophomore year of college, I started to drive to a secluded location to do all of my readings for school. I didn't live very far from the country, so it would only take about 20 minutes to drive to said peaceful location. I personally found the peace and tranquility of nature to be very soothing. 
I know it may sound crazy to some people that I would drive that far to the middle of nowhere just to do my schoolwork, but it really felt like I had no choice. It was the only way I could bring myself to concentrate on my work. When the end of my senior year was approaching, I was starting to freak out about one of my big exams. The exam itself was 40% of my final grade, and I needed at least a 75 on it to pass the course. I decided that I was going to spend the weekend before the exam studying, and that I was going to make my own little adventure out of the experience. Instead of going to my usual secluded spot, I was going to travel to an area a few hours inward. I would hike the beautiful trails and find another nice quiet spot to study. I left first thing Saturday morning and arrived at my destination around 10 or so. I spent the earlier parts of the day hiking until roughly 2 in the afternoon. I found this absolutely amazing spot near the top of this steep hill. It was a clearing that overlooked a bunch of trees. There were some rocks on the top of the hill too, so I was able to get comfortable with my books and computers set up on them. I started reading my textbook when I thought I could hear the sound of twigs snapping around me. Now, in my distracted brain, all I could concentrate on was that sound of twigs snapping. It was absolutely driving me crazy. I first thought there must be some sort of deer or small animal prancing around in the woods nearby. I debated on whether I should go over and maybe scare the animal away. Whatever it was would surely flee further away into the woods and away from me so I could focus. I made my way over to the edge of the tree line and shouted some nonsense noises to try and scare whatever this was away. I heard nothing back. I made a sound again and clapped my hands together. Again, I heard nothing. I stared intently through the thick trees when I swore I caught a glimpse of a silhouette of a person moving behind one of them. I figured my mind was playing tricks on me. I kept looking for a little while longer, but I realized the noise had stopped altogether. I thought to myself that whatever I'd done must have worked. I sat back down and started to read my textbook again, but now I couldn't concentrate because I couldn't ditch the feeling that something was not right about this. I flipped through several pages several times. Once I realized I was not retaining anything, I simply decided to pack my things up and start heading back. I was fairly far away from where I'd parked anyway, so I figured it was about time to start heading back. I would just find a spot to study that was a bit closer to where I'd parked, but still in seclusion. When I walked over to the tree line though, I paused in fear. Standing about 30 feet away, shrouded by trees, was the backside of what appeared to be a man. Their shoulders were very broad, but because their back was facing me, I couldn't be sure who they were. They were dressed all in black, and it looked like they were wearing some sort of covering on their face. I didn't move or say anything. I just stood there frozen and tried to calm down. I had a million thoughts flying through my head. It felt like I was stuck there for an eternity, but in reality, it was probably only a few seconds later. The person turned to abruptly face me. I can't accurately express how much fear I felt in that moment. Whatever mask they were wearing was horrifying. It appeared to be some sort of homemade creation, since I'd never seen a mask like this in my life. It appeared to be white and also had a long snout hanging down. It almost looked like something out of Beetlejuice. The eyes on this mask were jet black, and wild hair protruded from random patches on it. I think the hair was attached to the mask too, not to the person. It was sort of an old rotten yellow color. The person started to hum. I didn't notice it at first, but it appeared to be some sort of melody. It was a really long, drawn-out hum, almost like a groan coming from this person. They started to approach me. I freaked out. The clearing I was in was not that big, so in order to walk back to the trail, I would have to move past this person. I could have slid down the hill, but I might have broken my computer and also my legs. It was extremely steep and very high up. As soon as they'd started moving, 
this person started to run full speed at me, still making that horrible groaning noise. I can't even believe what happened next. The person ran right at me, and right when they were about to grab me, they just stopped in front of me. I stepped back in fear, and they began to laugh at me. Then they started humming again. They didn't actually lay a single finger on me. They just moved their hands around me as if they wished to touch me but couldn't. Not wanting to know what was happening or take any chances, I ran as fast as I could around them. As I sprinted further away, I could now hear the person trying to follow close behind me, still humming their tune. I didn't bother to turn around. I made it to my car and discovered that person no longer appeared to be following me. I did try to call the police, but of course phone service was pretty shoddy in this area. I drove several miles to the closest town and called the police once I got there. I reported what happened, but I don't think they did anything with it. Technically, the person didn't do anything other than disturb me. There were also no other complaints about the area. I have no idea what the freak was doing in those woods. I don't know if they were playing some type of prank or something truly messed up. Maybe they actually wanted to hurt me. It seems unlikely it was a prank though. I didn't see anybody else in the woods and it seemed like we were the only two people in the area. I realized that maybe I shouldn't complain since I was unharmed in the incident, but the psychological trauma that I felt still sticks with me to this day. I'll never forget that terrible afternoon and the memories of that horrifying mask. I've spent the better part of my adult life as a painter. It can be tedious work, but it's paid me decent over the last 10 plus years. Being a painter has allowed me to open my own business, and to this day it's been very successful. Over the years, I've painted all sorts of houses. New ones, old ones, and everything in between. I had painted some houses that looked like heinous crimes had taken place there even, but none of the houses have ever been more memorable than a single house I was contracted to paint that was truly in the middle of Nowhereville, USA. You see, about 40 minutes away from where I lived at the time was this beautiful estate on many acres of land. I don't remember the exact numbers, but I do know it was a really big house with three stories and very old. The man who bought the house was an investor of some kind from Florida and wanted to buy a house in this area for some reason. I didn't really care about any of that though. The guy was paying me well and a job is a job. My crew for this job was myself, my brother, and his wife. Since the house was so big, it was easily going to take several days on end to paint the entire interior. The guy didn't live here, and the house was empty, so that made it a bit easier. He was putting in some new flooring in a couple of weeks, so I wasn't worried about covering the floors either. It just made the job that much more simple. We started on Monday, and we were hoping to be finished by the end of the week. Since nobody was at this house, I was even planning on staying there a few late nights to get in some extra work. Monday was a little bit slow, but we did put in some decent hours. Tuesday, we really picked up some steam and got a lot of work done. My brother and his wife left at around 5.30 p.m., but I decided to stay behind and finish up one of the rooms we'd been working on. Well, those few hours I'd planned on staying turned into about five more, which was a major mistake. My back started to hurt so badly. I was feeling incredibly stiff, too. It was closing in on 11 p.m., and I still needed to drive home. I also had to shower, eat, and get ready to be back there around 9 in the morning. I started cleaning myself up a bit and getting organized for the next day before I left. While I was gathering up some brushes and tape, I thought I heard the sound of whispering coming from one of the other rooms in the house. This house was objectively freaky. I mean, it was a giant mansion in the middle of nowhere with no furniture. It looked like a recipe from a horror movie. I'm not gonna lie, I almost expected a ghost or something to jump out. 
After a quick and not very thorough investigation, though, I chalked up all that whispering to just my mind. Or perhaps the wind or the house settling in. The house was old after all, so having a draft causing a creepy wind sound did not seem impossible. The next day came, and I was feeling quite sore from the night before. Still, though, I needed to get a good jump on the day ahead. I told my brother and his wife about the creepy whispers, though. They were actually pretty freaked out. She's all about ghosts and creepy things, so she was having a real field day with this story. That evening, they decided to stay late with me and knock out a bunch more painting. I think really, though, they wanted to potentially hear this spooky ghost. Either way, I was quite happy for the help. A little bit after nine, I heard a loud scream come from upstairs. It was my brother's wife, and it sounded like one of those life or death type screams. I remember having the thought running upstairs that maybe she was playing some sort of joke on us, but the scream sounded too real, and I didn't want to risk it. When we finally made our way to the room at the end of the hall, she was laying on the fetal position on the ground by the window she had been painting. She had a stand-up light that had been knocked over next to her, and some of the paint had been spilled across the ground, too. At first, she was inconsolable. My brother was trying to ask her what happened, but she couldn't get any words out. I was more freaked out than I'd ever been in my entire life. I didn't have a clue what was happening, and I actually started to wonder if she'd actually seen a ghost, as unplausible as that may seem. She finally started to speak, though and with fear in her trembling voice, she said, I was painting around the windowsill. I saw the closet door behind me start to open. When I turned around, two people ran out of the closet down the hall somewhere. That was scarier to me than any ghost story. The idea of ghosts is quite silly when you think about it. You can just brush that off. But two people hiding in the closet? Well, that freaked me out much more than a hypothetical apparition. We grabbed our phones and went to the car, where we barely had any service. We did have just enough to call the police, though, and the homeowner. Even though the house was out in the middle of nowhere, the police showed up relatively quickly, at least for the location. They searched the home, and we were horrified when they escorted not two, but three people out of the house. Two women and a man. The look in their eyes as they were being apprehended is still burned into my memory. They had these sort of dead but furious eyes, staring daggers at me in particular. Apparently, these people had been squatting there for months even before the house had been purchased. They'd somehow avoided being seen or found during that entire time. It makes my skin crawl, thinking I was alone in that house with them, and I had no idea they were even there. I don't know if they intended on hurting us, but all three of them had weapons on them, I'm happy I didn't have to find out. I'm not sure exactly what happened to them after they were arrested. All I know is that this job made me feel off from the very beginning, and apparently my gut feeling was correct. I'll never forget the sound of my brother's wife screaming out of my head. That's the kind of sound I hope to never hear again. Going through a hard breakup can make you do some things you're not proud of. For a lot of people, that means going out and meeting someone to rebound with, which is never a good thing. For some people, you can even meet a rebound without even realizing it. And that's what happened to me. About a year ago, I had been with my ex for six years, when we finally broke up. It really hit me hard. It really hit me hard, and I was struggling for a while. We'd bought a house together even, but she kept the house in the end. I honestly didn't want to stay there. It just depressed me being there. And so, with my now limited funds, I found myself a cheap place to rent. I wanted to lay low and get back on my feet, afford a nicer spot eventually. I literally let her keep everything when we broke up, so I didn't really have anything to my name. I found a month-to-month -month place to rent on the marketplace, and that's when I realized there was a ton of stuff on there to actually buy, too. 
I bought a couch, a recliner, a TV, anything you could really think of. I felt like the king of saving money. The one thing I didn't have, though, was some tables and chairs, which made it sort of hard to have people over, either to play games or even just eat food together. I found this girl, who we'll call Leia, who was selling a table and a set of chairs. They looked very nice and in great shape, so I messaged her. Long story short, I went and took a look at the merchandise. They were just as advertised. While I was there loading up the chairs in my truck, I started talking with her. Turns out she'd also just gone through a horrible breakup, and she was unloading a bunch of stuff. Well, our small talk turned into two hours of laughing and joking in her driveway. We ended up exchanging numbers and set up a little date to go out and grab a drink that weekend. I was real excited about this, since I felt I had a sort of connection with her. The date went well, too. We went back to her place after the bar that night, which led on to several more dates. Before I knew it, I was seeing this girl on a regular basis. About a month later, though, I started to notice that some weird things were happening. I would go to the bathroom, and my phone would be in a different place, or my computer screen, which had been idle, was now turned on. I figured she was trying to snoop on me or something, which, in all honesty, I had nothing to hide anyway. So I really didn't push the matter. I just sort of shrugged it off. I figured she would realize I wasn't hiding anything, and she would eventually stop going through my stuff. One night, we started hanging out after we both got home from work, and I could tell she was really upset. I asked her what was going on, and she told me she had seen I had been texting my ex. She was worried I was going to go back to her. For context here, I had texted my ex recently asking if she'd received my doctor's bill in the mail, since I hadn't received it at my current address yet. She responded by saying she'd let me know if it ever showed up, and that was the end of the conversation. I wasn't mad yet. I understand some people have severe trust issues, and how that can be really tough. I explained it well to her what happened, and told her that I wasn't mad, but she should always talk to me about this stuff. The rest of the night was pretty fine. Next Saturday, she stayed over at my place. We fell asleep at about midnight, but I woke up a little bit after 3 in the morning because of a strange feeling. When I looked up, she was standing on my bed over me, literally standing on the bed, holding one of my golf clubs above her head with both hands. I instantly put both my hands up to block and slid to an upright position. I asked her what was going on, and if she was alright. She was practically sobbing, and I could barely understand her. When she was able to finally get the words out, she told me this. I know you're hiding something. Where is it? I truly had no idea what she was talking about. I slid on the bed backward while she was still sobbing. Thankfully, she caught me just a second too late. She swung the club down and missed me by just half an inch. I ran out into the living room and couldn't believe my eyes. She'd completely torn apart my home. I mean, she ripped up all the pillows, knocked over the bookshelves, even went through all the cabinets in the kitchen. My computer was open, and I could see hundreds of tabs open. I started to get a bit livid. She had ruined all my stuff. She came out of the bedroom, no longer holding the golf club. She was bawling, begging me to forgive her, claiming she hadn't meant to destroy everything. Then, like the flip of a switch though, the tears and sobbing turned into anger. I'm just so hurt about Nicole. I'm sure I looked quite confused, since I had no idea who this Nicole could be, or who she was talking about. I tried to start defending myself, but she started shouting she knew all about Nicole. She'd seen everything. With no notice, she charged at me and pulled a knife out from her waistband. Thankfully, I'm much bigger than her, so I was able to hold her back until I could reach the door. Once I got to it, I ran out as fast as I could to the local corner store. It was open 24 hours a day. I burst through the front doors and told them to call the police right now. Thank God they did, and the police showed up pretty quickly. I explained to them everything, and this whole ordeal ended up being an even bigger nightmare. 
Turns out that Leia was unfortunately not very well in the head. I'm sure that's quite obvious now. I'm not exactly sure what she ended up being diagnosed with, but I was actually kind of sad for her. In the moments where she was actually sane, she was such a sweet girl. I hope she ended up getting the help she needed. I still think about that night quite a lot. The memory of her standing over me as I woke up with a golf club was something I'll never forget. Ever since I bought that table from her, I haven't used the Facebook marketplace and I honestly don't think I ever will again. I went through a period of time where I was really scared of what was happening in my life. It started fairly normally, even to the point in which I didn't realize something was going on. It wasn't until I was able to step back and go over many specific details that I was able to see what was happening the entire time. If I take a look back in time, I think the first time I noticed this lady was when I was at the grocery store one day. I was a bit of a recluse, spending all my time in my home, which was a big country house about an hour away from town. Being at the grocery store was pretty much the only time I really had a chance to pay attention to people. She was 20 years younger than me, and sort of dark. What I mean by that is that she wore dark clothes, had dark hair that looked like it had been dyed black, and had many facial piercings as well. That's the reason why I really remembered her right off the bat. She seemed very different from the people I'd usually see. At the time, I remember thinking that she kept on looking over at me, but when I looked back at her, she would look down or look away. At the time, I thought that I just kept noticing her over and over again due to her striking appearance. It was also a big grocery store, and she kept showing up in the aisles right after I would first set foot in them. It did start to get a bit weird to me, I guess, but not something I would have seriously worried about. It was after that time, though, when I began to see this lady around far more often whenever I came into town. Again, though, I didn't really think too much about that at first. I mean, after you've clearly noticed someone or something more than once, you generally do see them around more often because you notice them more. I started noticing she seemed to be at the grocery store every time I came to go shopping. There were a couple of times I caught her walking behind me when I turned a corner and just happened to look back. In those cases, she would normally just continue forward and stop following me. One day, though, I got this strange letter in the mail. It was addressed to me by name and was written in all uppercase letters in pencil. In the letter, I was told that I was a horrible person because I had changed my name. It said that I should admit who I am and stop hiding the truth or the letter writer would be forced to reveal it for me and at that time I would really regret it. I honestly didn't know what to think of this other than it being very weird. I guess when you're the recipient of something so odd you probably just want to feel better by pretending it doesn't mean anything. At the time, I definitely did not make the connection between seeing that lady showing up wherever I went and this letter. There wasn't anything really tying the two together at that point. After a while, though, I got a second letter. This second letter seemed to be much more severe in tone, making vague threats at me, while alleging I was hiding all these things that would be brought out into the open if I didn't reveal them myself. After getting more and more of these letters in the mail, I finally decided they seemed pretty serious. I went to the police and filed a report about them. Unfortunately, that was really the only thing that could be done, since there was no way of telling who had sent the letters to me. After getting threatening letters in the mail over and over again for some time, I very obviously began to get somewhat paranoid. All of them made horrendous threats about what would happen to me if I continued to ignore the letters. The police, of course, had not done anything at all to help me feel better. I kept on expecting something bad to eventually happen. I would be nervous just walking around outside or going to the store, worried that the letter writer would eventually show up and do something. 
I normally felt pretty safe when I was at home, though, because other than receiving those letters, nothing had really happened at home before. That was the only saving grace of this entire thing. I felt completely safe when I was at home. I sat down that night and decided to try and read a book I was struggling to get through. I had a small study on the second floor that I liked to use to read in. I went up there with a cup of tea and tried to focus on my reading. As soon as I sat down, though, I could tell that something was off. I couldn't quite explain what it was, but I had this very strange feeling. If you've ever had one of those moments when you just couldn't get comfortable, or something was in the way of you feeling normal, you know exactly how I was feeling. I got up a few times and tried to fix myself something else to drink as well, but I just couldn't get this feeling to go away. I couldn't figure out why it was hanging around me either. A short time later though, for some reason I can't quite figure out, I decided to turn to my left and look out the window. It was hard to see outside because it was dark. Living in that area, there weren't street lights or anything like that. As I looked though, there was something outside in the tree just beyond the window. It looked like it was moving around. But after I squinted my eyes and tried to see everything more clearly, I jumped as I saw the strangest thing. There was someone outside my window, looking in at me. When I caught sight of them, they froze like a deer in the headlights, and I recognized them immediately. It was the woman I had seen weeks before. She was up in the tree that gave her view right into my window. I freaked out and grabbed my phone to call the police. However, when I looked back out the window, she had already disappeared. I ran downstairs and made sure all of my doors were locked. I was fortunate they already were. I turned on the outside lights and searched around for the woman, but she was already gone. When the police arrived, of course they didn't find anything. All I could do was file a report and give them a description of this woman that I didn't really know anything about. I didn't know why she was in the tree but I began to think that maybe it was her that had been writing all those letters. I mean, how long had she been spying on me? There could have been many times she had been watching me in my house, and I would have never known. Now, whenever I went outside, I was always worried about running into her. When I was at home, I was worried she was watching me. I thought she might not show herself again since I had caught her, but the thing about that is, you can never be sure. Nothing happened for a while, but the nothing was maybe even scarier than if something had happened. It was a time full of fear and paranoia. Finally though, something did occur. I didn't receive any other letters, but I did find a small package sitting on my front porch. It was addressed to me, but I hadn't been expecting anything to be delivered. When I opened up the package, I knew it had something to do with all of this immediately. There was no letter inside, but what was in the box was the only message I needed to be scared. There was a dead bird inside. It was a crow, which scared me even more, because I love crows, and I have pictures of them in my house. This choice of bird was not random. What could I do? Only file another police report. I didn't have any information that would help me find this woman. I had no way of doing anything at all to figure this out and feel safe. So, how does this story all end? Well, it's probably a little disappointing. I didn't get any other letters after the crow. I never caught the woman in my tree ever again either. In fact, I never saw her walking around the streets again. I never got over being scared so much though, and even to this day, I don't know if some psycho is still watching me. The strangest kid I ever knew in my entire life was a guy named Alan. I actually say that as a compliment, however. Being a bit of a strange kid and now a strange adult myself, it only makes sense that I would be interested in other strange people. Knowing Alan was not only strange though, but became quite dangerous at a point has profoundly affected my views. I moved around a whole lot when I was a kid. It wasn't that we were in the military or anything interesting like that, though. 
My dad was just an alcoholic and was able to get a doctor to lie for him in order to get disability. We would be in a house for a while until he began screwing up again and not paying rent. When that happened, we had to start looking for a new place all over. It was a process that I went through over and over again while I was growing up. I would be going to new neighborhoods and new school systems all the time. A lot of times when I would go to a new school, there would be some initial excitement among the kids to have a new student. That never lasted very long though. I wasn't the kind to make friends very easily or very well, and I sort of got depressed from the idea of constantly having to lose the friends I did make, so I stopped trying after a while, for the most part. Because of this, not long after arriving at any new school, I would become just another one of many social outcasts. I often think this is why I started getting so interested in more academic things. I don't think I came off as a nerd necessarily, but let's just say reading books was the most enjoyable thing for me. This move happened around the time I turned 14 years old. I went through the normal process of moving to a school, although this one was a school that I'm not completely sure I remember a whole lot about. My family moved into a rather big house that I was never quite sure how we could afford to be in. Perhaps it was because it was in the middle of nowhere, though a lot of those houses out there could be pricey too. It didn't take a long time for the kids in the school to get bored with me, and it took even less time for me to get bored with them. Now, don't get me wrong, I wasn't bullied or anything like that. I just became one of those quiet loner kids who was left in the corner all alone. Of course, that's how I came across Alan, who just so happened to be another kid exactly like that. Alan and I had a lot of the same interests with some distinct differences. Whereas I liked to do good in school, he didn't really care about that in any way. He certainly had the knowledge and put forth the effort to learn things on his own, but he didn't bother to try and do well in anything involving school. I, on the other hand, loved doing well in school. He was that guy that did really, really good on tests but never turned in a single homework assignment. One of the things we both hadn't learned in school but were really interested in was astronomy. That was our major point of interest that we shared. We both lived in really rural areas, but surprisingly far apart from each other. In the areas we were in, though, it made it pretty good to have a hobby like astronomy. He always claimed the view from his house was likely even better than the view from mine. I didn't really know how he figured such a thing, because he'd never been to my house before. We were all worked up and excited about a meteor storm that was coming around once on a fall day. Like before, he insisted it would be better if we watched it from his place. So finally, I decided I would go ahead and take a trip over to his house and find out myself. I had to go with him by bus after school on a Friday afternoon. The shower was mainly going to be on Saturday night, although we were likely to see something on Friday evening too. It turned out Alan was not lying about him living even further out in the country than I did. I had a few people who lived close to me in the area that I lived at least. However, his house was all alone on a hill, with no other houses anywhere near his for miles around. There weren't any trees in the yard to obstruct a view either. All in all, he was absolutely right, and I was pretty surprised. Everything went fine the first night we were there. There was nothing different I noticed about Alan. We had a nice time and even saw some falling meteors that night. Alan suggested during the main phase of the shower that we climb up on top of the roof and watch from there. I was a bit afraid of heights, but I thought it would be cool to get a better view of the shower. The following night, we got situated on the roof with some snacks and things. Alan's parents were going to be out for the night. We had this telescope set up in case we needed to use it. We got up on the roof and started to watch the shower. I'd almost forgotten about my fear of heights while I was up there. Even so, at one point, Alan told me he wanted to show me Saturn on the telescope. Apparently, I would be able to see the rings that night, something I'd never experienced. He stood up and told me to follow him over. I got up to do that. Alan had a two-story house with a slanted roof, 
so I was a little wobbly when I stood up. I knew what happened next had nothing to do with just my balance, though. I felt Alan's hand shove me hard before I could regain my footing. I fell and rolled off the roof of the house and hit the ground hard. I could hear several bones breaking, so I was unable to get up again. Alan didn't help me. He let me call out for help over and over, but never answered me. I kept expecting it to be a mistake, that he would come running out of the house to help me at any moment, but he never did. I laid on the ground for hours and hours before Alan's parents finally came home. They found me and did what they could to get me to the hospital. Separately, they found Alan, still laying on the roof and watching the meteor shower as I lay on the ground screaming in agony. I found out afterward that Alan had a pretty dark history, and most of the kids and even a lot of the teachers wanted nothing to do with him. There were a few weird stories associated with him, and certain things he might have done to other kids. As it turned out, though, there were plenty of horrendous things he had done that were already basically confirmed as well. He'd gotten into some pretty bad fights growing up, including going completely mental on people nearly twice his size. I was surprised to learn he had such a violent background. Thus, that's the irony of the entire story. If I had been a little less antisocial when I first started up at that school, I may have been warned about what he was actually like. Someone may have told me what he was up to before I had to find out all on my own. The weather looked like it was going to be very bad that day, and possibly worse in the evening. I worked a roughly second shift job at the time, still do as a matter of fact, and had a really long commute home that I was not looking forward to. I didn't mind the drive itself for the most part, except when the weather was going to be bad and this looked like it was going to be a nasty storm of some sort. For most of the day it was strong with thunder and lightning, but it seemed like it was building up for hours and hours. When it was time for me to get off my shift, it was still in this weird holding pattern that didn't seem like it was ever going to break. I had a little pickup truck, and I clocked out at 11pm in order to start the over one hour drive it took to get home. I had a feeling it was going to take a little bit longer than normal tonight though. My ride home was mostly through some back roads, including some that were in the mountains. In this area, the best jobs normally took a lot of travel in order to get to. You kinda had to deal with the long rides in order to get a good job. This was going to be a very long drive. I didn't know quite how strong the wind was, but I could tell it was strong enough to shake the hell out of my truck. I had to drive much more carefully than usual, which meant the ride was going to take that much longer. The roads were normally very empty, but they seemed even more so on this night. I don't recall seeing a single car or truck for the majority of the ride. I made this drive more times than I could possibly tell you, so I can't explain why it is I made the mistake the way I did. It may have been because my truck was so small, and I was paying so much attention to trying to not get blown off the road, but eventually I ended up making the wrong turn. It was very similar to the turn I usually did take. That was because all the turns around here were just like that. My focus was off, and about halfway through I made that wrong turn. I was in sort of automatic mode, so I just kept following the road without realizing I was on the wrong one. I didn't exactly get lost, but it was a long while before I figured out I had taken the wrong turn. Those rural routes all seem very much alike. When I did realize it though, I didn't really think it was that big a deal. All I would have to do was turn around and head back home. The worst thing that was going to happen was that it was going to take me a whole lot longer now. From what it seemed like to backtrack and get back to the main road, there would be a total of 40 minutes added on to the trip. Luckily, I didn't have to get back to work the next day. So that really wasn't too much of a big deal to me. Mostly, I was still very concentrated on the weather and how rough it was on the drive. 
I got back on the road. The storm was still in build-up mode at that point. After an agonizing drive, I finally made it home. All of the lights were out, which made me think my roommate must have been out too, but I couldn't have been more wrong. When I got inside and checked out the inside of the house, I noticed that my roommate in fact had been nearly beaten half to death. I was able to get him to the hospital in time to save his life, thankfully. He didn't tell anyone else but me what actually happened. He dealt drugs, apparently, and got into a pretty nasty spat with his supplier. They tried to beat him to death because of it. That's scary enough in itself, but he said it happened just a half hour before I arrived home to find him. If I had never taken that wrong turn that took me 40 minutes out of my way, I would have been home at the same time for that wrong drug deal and may have gotten the exact same treatment. Who knows, maybe we both would have been killed that night. It's not uncommon to go through some hard times in your early 20s. Whether that's trying to find a job to save money or starting a family with the right partner, you name it. I'm sure there's a long list of people that share those struggles. I, of course, also went through some hard times in my early 20s, but I'm sure my situation is a little more unorthodox than that. I had every advantage in life growing up. I was funny, athletic, I had a loving family and great friends, and I came from a wealthy enough background that as long as I applied myself, I could have a pretty comfortable life. Yeah, that didn't exactly happen. I was too obsessed with being the funny guy, and I was never going to be good enough to be a pro athlete by any means. I was good enough to play football in college, though. I decided in my senior year of high school that I would rather party and hang out with my friends. Sports isn't everything. My parents were cool with me giving football up, even if it meant me giving up scholarships. I didn't have those sorts of parents that forced me to do sports or hobbies to get ahead. But I didn't expect that giving up that structure of football in my life forced me into doing some shady things in my free time. Long story short, I barely even made it through my senior year, and by the end of summer, I'd had a big falling out with my parents. I never went to college. Instead, I moved across to the East Coast for a few years, just being useless and offering nothing to society, really. Looking back, I was hanging out with questionable people at best and doing things I'm not very proud of. I have yet to come to peace with it now, and I'm in my 30s. My parents lived in Pennsylvania. I started making my way back up north when I was 22 years old, in an attempt to kind of apologize and turn my life around finally. I had reached my breaking point and decided I couldn't be homeless anymore. I was starting to feel really sick, and I knew that something wasn't right on the inside. I hitchhiked a massive chunk of the journey, and when I reached Virginia, I started walking again. I didn't call my parents, though. I didn't think they ever wanted to see me or talk to me again. I also didn't have a phone or any way to reach them, really. My plan was just to show up on their doorstep and hope for the best. One night, I think I was still in Virginia. I was walking through this nice park. I'm not talking about those playground parks. This was a massive area of forest with all types of trails running through it. I bet during the day, under the right circumstances, this place was probably gorgeous. Tonight, though, the dark trails were quiet and desolate, and for the first time in a long time, I felt somewhat at peace. It was pitch black, but I didn't mind. I always liked the dark, especially since I had been homeless. I considered Nightfall to be one of my best friends. I figured I would find a quiet place to lay down and get a relaxing night's sleep before the sun rose. Then I could continue my walk home. I was so exhausted that I fell asleep right away. I don't know how long I'd been sleeping when I was awoken slowly to the sound of whispering. 
One thing about being homeless is that you learn to kind of sleep with one eye open. I rolled to the side of the big tree I was leaning on and tried to focus in the darkness to see where the sounds were coming from. Well, I didn't need to be a detective to find the source. About 15 feet away from me was a group of men. I think there were five of them, but there may have been one or two more. They had flashlights and were shining them into the forest where I was laying. I heard one of the guys shout from the darkness, He's over there! I know I saw a person sleeping. The light danced back and forth, and then the beam stopped directly on my face. The guy with the light shouted out, Oh dude, he's right here! I heard them continue to whisper and laugh. I didn't know what these guys wanted. As I stared back like some frightened animal, the man holding the light said in a confident voice, It's okay, dude. Come on out. Why are you sleeping out here in the woods? For some reason, I felt safe about this and started making my way toward the group of guys. I told them I was homeless and trying to make my way back home. As I got closer, the guys were all eyeing me down. They seemed to be smiling, like they were greeting an old friend. One of the guys grabbed my arm and helped me over to some rocks to join them. As soon as I was face to face with the group, the guy with the light shouted, Oh dude, you reek! Another guy started to laugh uncontrollably. I started to feel kind of embarrassed. I was going to try and say something, but before I could even get any words out, the man with the flashlight struck me across my face with the light. I fell to the ground, holding my head in pain. I could hear the guy laughing and joking, as they all started to kick me while I was down, screaming things like, Get a job, deadbeat! Stop ruining our parks with your filth! I gave up trying to fight back after a while and just let the beatdown continue. They stopped after a few minutes. As I was laying there, I could feel the ground spinning beneath me. These guys had done a real number on me. They started to talk among themselves about something completely unrelated, a girl from class or something. I couldn't believe they'd just beaten me so badly that I couldn't even see straight, and they were completely unfazed while talking about this girl. I tried to get up and make a run for it, but as soon as I got to my feet, I felt dizzy. The world started spinning as I tried to take a step. I must have looked real messed up, because the guy started to cackle right behind me. And through their hysterical laughter, one of the guys looked at me. Look at him, trying to run. Look how stupid he looks. I'm not sure how far I made it, before I felt an intense pain in the back of my head. Everything went completely black. I remember these passing moments, seeing the guys walking by and laughing. The only thing I can really remember is they were roughly college age. They had to be since they were talking about people in class. I think one of them had a Virginia University shirt on. Next thing I remember is waking up in the woods, surrounded by a few different people. They were hikers on their phone with the paramedics. I was somehow able to form enough sentences to tell them my name and a few details of the prior evening. One of the women who was sitting with me while waiting for the paramedics asked if she could call someone for me. This is when I finally broke down and just called my parents on her phone. They wasted no time and drove down to Virginia to get me and make sure I was alright. After that night, my life changed pretty drastically. It turned around, really. I moved home for a while until I got back on my feet and started online programs for college. Eventually, I got my business degree. When I was homeless, I had seen some messed up things, but none of those things held a candle to that night. I thought my life was going to be over in that moment. Surrounded by insane adults that feel no remorse as they attacked another human being, then laughed as I lied there, nearly motionless and in pain. Monsters aren't always hiding under your bed or in your closet. Sometimes they can be the very normal people we see in our everyday lives. I've spent the better part of the last four years taking care of my sick grandfather. My grandmother died over ten years ago, and unfortunately, my dad didn't have a good relationship with his father. It wasn't easy toward the end, but he ended up passing away a few months back. I took it much harder than the rest of the family, 
since I spent a lot more time with Grandpa. I guess it should have come as no surprise to me, though, that he left me his house in the will. The house was in pretty bad shape, though. For starters, it wasn't in a great area. My grandparents had built the house almost 70 years ago, when the area was nothing but forests and a few roads. Now, the house was in a busy area of the town. The neighborhood where the house sits is one of the most crime-ridden areas in my hometown. Add that to the fact the house hadn't had any updates or repairs in over a decade, and you have a house that's quite honestly not really wanted by anyone. I spoke to a realtor, who told me they would be able to sell the house even though it was in a rough area. It was big, and she told me people would often buy houses in these areas to accommodate their entire families. She gave me a small list of things I needed to do first. Then we were going to list the house the following week. I tirelessly cleaned that house for days on end. In his older age, my grandpa had become a bit of a hoarder and had things everywhere. Not only that, but I just kind of felt depressed being there. I'd spent so much time there as a child, and even into adulthood. One night, I decided I was going to stay overnight and bang out the rest of my cleaning. My husband didn't stay, because he had to work in the morning. I was okay with that though, truthfully. I wanted to be here alone anyway, to come to peace with the fact my grandpa had moved on. I truly worked all night. When I finally looked back at the clock, it was almost 3.30 in the morning. I was shocked and felt good about the work I had done. I went into the living room, which was at the back of the house. I turned on a small desk lamp and started to read for a little while. I planned on reading until I got tired and fell asleep. I couldn't have been reading for longer than five minutes, though, when I started to hear a very strange noise. I did listen to it, but I didn't pay much attention to the noise at first. Eventually, though, it became much too hard to ignore. It sounded like movement. I tried to reason with my logic and tell myself it was either my old pipes or my imagination of my grandpa. He just passed away after all and I really missed him. It was entirely possible. I was subconsciously trying to convince myself this was a sign from him. I slowly made my way down the long and dark hallway and toward the noises. They were getting louder and louder. At this point, it was just too hard to ignore. When I got to the front door, I was standing right next to the basement door. Whatever this sound was, it was clearly coming from down in the basement. And the basement of this house was sort of strange. From where I was standing in the kitchen, it was a long staircase down. In the back of the basement, though, you could just walk out the door. This is because my grandparents' house sits on a hill. I opened the basement door. The sounds were loud and echoing through the staircase. I don't know if it was just because I was sad or plain stupid, but my mind was telling me these noises were from my grandpa giving me some sort of sign from the afterlife. I slowly made my way down toward the basement. As I turned the corner, though, I saw two men digging through my grandpa's boxes. I quickly ran behind a stack of boxes and froze in place. The men had a flashlight, and I saw the beam of light fly toward my direction for just a moment, then go back to where it was before. I could hear them talking and shushing each other, but I couldn't make out any words. The only thing I did hear was a muffled voice. Be quiet. You don't want to wake that old man. Whoever these guys were, they thought my grandpa was still alive. I was praying they would leave and not find me, hiding on the other side of the basement. I was too scared to make a run for it, and I didn't dare take two people on at once. My phone was upstairs, and my purse was in the kitchen. I figured my best course of action was to stay hidden and hope they didn't find me. A couple of minutes at least had passed, and the two guys ran off out the back door of the basement. I waited for a while after that moment before I moved. Once I decided it was safe, I ran upstairs, got my purse, and drove home. At this point, it was 4.45 in the morning, and my husband would be waking up for work soon. I came back frantically, and my husband woke up. I told him everything, and he called into work so he could stay with me for the day. 
We went over to my grandparents' house in the morning so we could look and see if the back door was damaged and if anything had been stolen. Most notably, the door was not broken. Whoever had gotten in through the basement had just walked right in. Admittedly, I hadn't been down there that much, so I didn't even bother to check if the other door had been locked prior. We looked at the boxes they were going through. They didn't have too much in them that I would consider valuable. It was newspapers, pictures, and some old knickknacks. I suppose they could have taken something valuable, but I don't even know. What could have been down there that was so valuable anyway? We did end up making an official report. When all was said and done, I didn't expect any answers. By the time it crossed my mind to call the police, I was already almost home, and figured by that point it was a waste of time. We eventually finished cleaning the house during the daytime hours, then sold it a couple of weeks later. I'll never forget that memory of seeing those two men standing in my grandpa's basement, rummaging through all his things. Almost five years ago, I moved to Vermont from Maryland. Not for myself, but for my wife, who'd secured some type of hospital administration job. I don't really know the specifics of the job myself. All I know was the pay was outstanding enough that it made it worth moving. Not to mention her new company paid for us to move. Back home in Maryland, I didn't have what you would call a great job. It wasn't bad either, though. It was enough to make a living off of. I was a manager of one of the local supermarkets in the area. The only issue I really had was that I'd already hit a ceiling for my pay, and my wife was starting at a drastically higher rate than I was already making. That meant it was a no-brainer. We settled into the new place in no time. My wife made friends at her new job almost right away, and life was looking pretty good. I was looking for work all over, and I ended up getting a job at Target. That job only lasted about two weeks, though, because I got a call for a much better-paying job. A small, independently-owned supermarket was not far away from where we lived, and it just so happened they were looking for a new store manager. I loved this job at first. It wasn't anything like working in a chain store like I had done in the past. It was fairly low maintenance, and the hours were fantastic. The store was only open from 7 in the morning till 8 at night. Within just a couple of months, I was already running that store like a well-oiled machine. The owner loved me and trusted me. Surprisingly, I was making much more at this independent store than I had been at the chain market in Maryland. One afternoon, the owner came in and started ranting about how he hated all the end displays and how they looked. He decided he wanted to do a full remodel. I will say the average person would never notice this, but this guy ran a good company, and he wanted everything to be in top shape all the time. Can't say I really blame him. There he started talking about hiring some extra hands to do all this remodeling. I told him not to waste his money. I suggested instead I come in overnight for a few days next week and knock out all that remodeling stuff he wanted myself. He agreed, and we locked it into the schedule for the next week. I scheduled myself and three other employees to work overnight Tuesday through Thursday. I figured having eight hours overnight uninterrupted would be plenty enough time. Tuesday night came and went, and we made some good progress. I was looking forward to the rest of the shifts, because we had a lot of fun that night. We just blasted our favorite music and went to town redoing displays, cleaning and totally revamping one section of the store. Wednesday night started just like Tuesday. We were doing an awesome job. Sometime during the middle of the shift though, one of the employees, a woman named Jade, came up to me. She looked like she had just seen a ghost. I asked her if she was okay. She shook her head and asked if we could talk in the office for a minute. When we got to the office, I asked her if she was okay again. She looked more concerned and angry at this point than scared and upset. In a low voice, as if she was trying to be quiet, she said, When I was in the bathroom, someone came in and stood on the other side of the door. I yelled at them, and they just stood there like a full minute. Then they turned around and ran out the bathroom. 
I took in everything she'd just said. I understood her concerns. Jane was the only woman on my crew tonight, so whoever was in the bathroom with her obviously was not supposed to be there. Jade's a tough woman who doesn't take crap from anybody. She didn't want to tiptoe around this. She wanted to go out there point blank and ask who had gone and followed her into the woman's restroom. So, one thing about working for an independent company is that sometimes you can handle things in more unconventional ways. I don't always agree with this, but sometimes it's easier to just get to the bottom of things. I confronted the other employees directly. They all denied it rather passionately. A minute later, Jay joined us in one of the aisles, and a big screaming match ensued. All of a sudden, though, Jade stopped yelling. We all looked at her confused, and noticed she was looking down at the shoes of the other employees. I'm so sorry, I don't think it was any of you guys. The person standing there had these brown shoes and blue jeans. I could see the fade on the bottom from underneath the stall. I looked over and all the other employees were wearing sneakers. We all went into the back room as one and made our way to the bathrooms. Located near the bathroom door was some back stock that had been knocked over. One of the boxes looked like it had a dent from a boot in it. I can't speak for everyone, but I felt a pit forming in my stomach. Right above the bathrooms was a storage area, almost like a loft or crawl space. I don't know if everyone else was having the exact same thoughts, but I was thinking that someone was hiding up there. It made sense to me. It was right above the woman's bathroom, and they would have had to climb on the back stock to get up there. I grabbed a ladder and went up to the storage area. It was a mess up there. All the holiday decorations, extra shelves, old promotional materials, you name it. It was all shoved up there. I got to the top and took a few steps around. I noticed some beer cans on the ground and empty boxes of cookies. I even saw an empty tray of ground beef. I was taking careful steps as I moved through the area, and then I saw him. Right there in the back corner of the loft was a man. He was just standing there, staring right back at me. What was the most horrifying was that he had been standing there the entire time, and I had just noticed him. His eyes were so bug-eyed wide, they looked like they were going to pop out of his head. His hair was wild, and he looked angry. I stood still at first, making eye contact, and trying to decide what to do. I heard one of my co-workers yell from the bottom, Hey! Anything up there? I yelled back to call the police right now. As I finished saying that, the man charged at me. Thankfully, it was such a mess up there that he tripped over something in the darkness and hit his head. He started rolling around in pain, and I started to yell. Two of my employees ran up there and helped me hold the man down as he started to recompose himself. He started to scream and squirm around, but my employees were pretty big. This man was not going anywhere. The cops thankfully showed up quickly as well. The owner showed up too, since I'd called him as soon as we had the guy held down. The cops arrested the man, and we were left with one wild story. We found out after the fact that the man had a knife on him, but he'd never pulled it out since he'd tripped. He used to work at the store apparently when he was 18 years old. He was in his 30s now, and sadly not really all there mentally anymore. I don't know what happened to him. The incident just happened recently, and when it was over, nobody really wanted to talk about it. For me, it was one of the craziest and scariest moments of my life though, being face to face with this man in the darkness. Even if I didn't get physically hurt, I still think about this all the time. Especially when I look up at the storage area. It's just scary to think about the fact that sometimes when you're supposed to be alone, you're really not. Kids in my town used to swim at the local reservoir all the time, from early spring to early in the fall. It was on what we called the Old Airport Road, a deserted, forested stretch of dirt road that eventually led to a small airport in my area, hence the name. There was a rocky cliff area that some kids would be dared to jump off from, and sometimes my friends and I would have water balloon fights from the top of there, pelting the ones down below in the water. 
The water was always clean and pretty cold. It was overall just a pretty and quiet spot to enjoy your time in the water. It all changed one day, however, when the bodies were found. The story goes that a family from a neighboring town had gone to the reservoir after hearing about how nice it was and decided to have a picnic and swim around for a while. For a little bit, everything was okay. The kids had gone around a bend in the reservoir, and the parents still heard the sounds of them playing, so they thought everything would be okay, and that they'd see them in just a minute. Then, things suddenly went quiet. I mean real quiet, too. The type where even the birds stopped chirping in the trees because there's something dangerous nearby. The parents obviously grew concerned, and went poking around the top of the rock ledges to check on their kids. Two little boys, seven and five. That's when they found their boys poking at something with a big stick just on the water's edge. Something bloated, distended, purple and wearing a bright red hoodie. It was the body of a young girl, just floating there in the reservoir. She looked pale, and her eyes were bulging from her head. Her parents yelled at them to get away from the body and come there right this minute. The family members were interviewed, which is how we know this, especially the accounts from the children. The canine units were quickly dispatched as well. They combed through every inch of the surrounding reservoir, but the dogs couldn't pick up any scent other than this girl's. She was labeled a Jane Doe. No family or friends seemed to be looking for her, and the case went cold only a few months in. What little we do know is that she died of strangulation, not blunt head trauma like the family thought, and it's likely she had been sexually assaulted beforehand. Now, kids don't really go to that reservoir anymore, out of fear. Fear that we'll find another body just like that girl's. Fear they might become another casualty on the water for another family innocently enjoying the scenery to find. The killer is obviously still out there somewhere. Maybe he moved on. Maybe he decided to only kill once and that was enough for him. Maybe he's still out there, living a normal life along the old airport road. I don't know if we're ever going to find out who did this. My friend, we'll call her Kay's family, was always more well-off than most, with enough disposable income to buy some very luxury items. With enough disposable income to buy some luxury items. New cars, the latest gadgets or technology, even a full party boat. It's that party boat and my first experience out on the water that I'd like to focus on today. That boat was a real nice one cherry red with a single sparkle in the paint, with a built-in sun cover and comfortable seats situated in a ring around the deck. Although it was relatively small, it was enough for a group of teens to go out on the local lake and party one night. Long story short, Kay had just gotten her driver's license. One night, she called me and a few of our friends and classmates up, got in the truck with the boat attached, and drove off while her parents were out of the house. Yeah, she basically stole that boat. Some hearing this will condemn those actions, and maybe some won't. I just felt it was an important thing to mention. The group consisted of Kay, myself, our friend Jake, and his older brother Clayton. Now, Clayton was 20 at the time, and in his sophomore year of college, the rest of us were all between 17 and 18. Kay had had a huge but silent crush on him for quite a while. We all knew he would probably never reciprocate her feelings, but that didn't stop her from trying or dropping hints constantly. I think inviting him to a stolen boat party out on a lake at night with underage drinking was definitely her biggest one. It took some finagling to set everything up and get the boat going in the water, as she'd only seen her dad do this once or twice. Once we did, Clayton took over driving, as he was the oldest and therefore the most responsible. I say that with a huge grain of salt, as he had just as much idea of how to drive a boat as the rest of us. We did a few circles on the lake, 
The wind was frigid as it whipped past us. Kay and I cuddled together for warmth, with Jake telling his brother to slow down a bit. We were obviously making a lot of noise. It was hard to hear anything as the darkness around us slipped by, slick as oil. It was impossible to tell where the ground was in the darkness, where the sky ended and the water began. Clayton laughed, and I'm pretty sure he said something, but his voice was very muffled by the wind. He had already had a couple of cans of beer while we were fumbling setting up the boat, too, so he wasn't in the clearest state of mind. Kay turned to me and whispered in my ear, Hey, I'm gonna try to kiss him later. Her eyes were bright with drunkenness. She'd taken up on the beer already as well, after she saw him doing it. Most likely, she wanted to impress him and show him how mature she was. I was going to tell her I didn't think that was a good idea. I mean, he was in college and it would be kind of weird, right? But I didn't even have time to finish that thought. There was a jolt and a shuddering, scraping sound that vibrated the floor beneath our feet. Suddenly, we were launched from the boat into the cold, dark water. The boat had slammed hard into some rocks that were jutting out at a very high speed, and it had completely flipped over. I was flung out a fair bit, but I later learned the boat had collapsed right on top of Clayton. Kay had been launched right into one of the rocks and broke her arm, but still managed to crawl her way to safety, since she landed not far away from the shore. In hindsight, that's partially what made us crash in the first place. Jake was yelling, and I saw the faint outline of his back as he dove under to look for his brother. Each time, he came up empty-handed. Dizzy, with my head fuzzing over from the impact, I swam over to help him look. I just remember him yelling over and over until his voice was completely strained. Clay? Clay, can you hear me? I dove under, groping at rocks and weeds and everything I could find until I had to come up for air. At the last second, my fingers brushed what I thought was the front of a shirt. Attached to an arm, attached to a body, I burst out of the water, screaming to Jake, I got him! He's right here! I dove back under. Together, we managed to get him to the shore where Kay was waiting, holding on to her broken arm. As she moved it around, I could tell it was flopping over in a way arms never should. Jake told us to call 911. He slapped his brother in the face, trying to get him to wake up. How the fuck do you do CPR? He said. We can't, Kay blurted, wincing in pain. I mean, we drank beer. I stole the boat. Kay, I said. I took her face in my hands, forcing her to look at me. I could see the whites of her eyes. She was clearly crying. We have to call. Come on. She nodded and grabbed me with her good arm. She cried as she dialed 911 in my arms. The police and ambulance came 15 minutes later. They took Clay away on a stretcher. Miraculously, he still had a faint pulse, but it was not looking good. Jake went with him in the ambulance while the cops drove me and Kay home. They lectured us on underage drinking and driving a boat recklessly. Kay's parents had gotten home earlier than expected, and they were waiting for Kay when she got back. When the cops explained to them what had happened, they didn't yell at Kay like I thought they were going to. Instead, they just hugged her and I tight and made us promise to never do something like that again. We were offered towels, a shower, and a change of clothes while waiting for my dad to pick me up. I felt numb and cold, even after a hot shower. Kay still cried beside me, begging Clayton to be okay. She really blamed herself for the whole thing. Although Clayton did live, he was never the same again. He had difficulty speaking and remembering things, and he couldn't really move without a walker or a wheelchair. His brain had been without oxygen too long to make a full recovery. Kay, Jake, and I visited him a lot these few months in the hospital, and although he couldn't remember our names sometimes, he wrote down on a piece of paper in his shaky handwriting that it was okay. He still lives with his parents and needs constant care. As for me, Jake, and Kay, we're doing all right. Last time I spoke with Kay, she went off to college in another state, or she could escape from that terrible night. Jake stayed in the area to help care for Clay, and he and I actually became a couple many years later. 
We now have a daughter together, and we've talked a lot about that night. We're going to make sure to educate her on boat safety, and how it's a very, very bad idea to go out on the water and not tell anyone where you're going. That it's exactly what happened to Uncle Clay. I really hope she listens to our advice. I'll start by saying that I'm deathly terrified of water. Any large, deep body of water, I refuse to go near it. Hell no. My wife finally convinced me to go to counseling after suffering through a lot of beach and pool trips with no swimming and not knowing why. That was part of the joke. She was actually really concerned about my well-being and why I wasn't opening up to her about it. When I finally did, she brought up counseling every day until I would go. My therapist recommended I journal my thoughts and open up to others about my fears so I could conquer them. After some soul-searching, I can trace my crushing fear of water to the old swim instructor I had when I was still in kindergarten. His name was Mark. He was in his early twenties from what I can remember, and was extremely fit, with the physique of someone who swam every day. He was extremely energetic with us kids, and unfortunately also very critical as well. He expected little two to five year olds swimming for the first time to jump right into the deep end, so to speak. He wanted us to be able to swim as well as he did after only a single lesson or two. My first lesson, the one my mom was present for, went about as well as you'd expect. He was very patient, nice, and helpful. He even guided me across the shallower parts of the lake and held me up as I tried and failed to kick. I forgot to mention, instead of traditional lessons at a swimming pool, Mark offered them over the summer at a lake in my town. The lake was so wide you could just barely see the other side over the horizon and the water ranged from blue to a dark muddy black on most days. There was a dock and a little strip of beach that I could play on after my lesson was over. That was if my mom wasn't tired after working. Some parts of the lake bottom were very rocky though. I remember getting out of the water a lot to find small scrapes and cuts on my feet after stepping on a few sharp rocks. Mark didn't care though, at least not when we were alone. He would just tell me to go back in the water, sometimes even pushing me in, causing me to trip and get scraped up even more. The worst part, though, was when he made me swim out deeper than I was comfortable with. If I started to get scared, he would call me a wuss or a baby, and things like that. He would keep on pushing me until I made it to whatever arbitrary point he'd set for that lesson. I'd get so tired from all that swimming. My mom said I used to fall asleep in the car after every lesson and had to be carried inside because my legs and arms were too strained to move. Mark would also tell me scary stories too. Ones about monsters hiding at the bottom of the lake with teeth and claws that would snatch up kids who were bad at swimming or too slow to escape them. I hated it. Every time he made me go out deep, I would picture gnashing teeth grasping at my legs from below and trying to pull me under, just like he'd said. I cried whenever I couldn't feel anything below me or see anything in the dark water. I guess it all came to a head one day, and after this experience, I never had swimming lessons with Mark again. Or anyone for that matter. It was a cloudy day on a Wednesday and I was dreading going out into the water when it would be most dark, almost an oily black. I really couldn't see anything, and I knew Mark was going to be mean about it. I don't really know why I didn't tell my mom about any of this. I guess I didn't want to disappoint her, since I was the one who begged to learn how to swim in the first place. Mark was waiting for me as usual, already in his swim shorts. As soon as I got out of the car, though, he immediately flashed me an angry look. He looked madder than I'd ever seen him before, and I could feel something drop in the pit of my stomach. Even back then, I knew something was wrong. I had on a neon pink swimsuit at the time with bright blue flowers, and Mark had noticed. He flatly, even with an intense look in his eyes, said, 
You know, the fish people are gonna see that easily. Maybe you should take it off. My heart just about stopped. I had just covered safety in kindergarten that week, and what to do and look out for if an adult in your life said something exactly like that. And boy, if that wasn't a get an adult you trust right away moment, I don't know what is. Just as quickly as the panic spiked, it settled though, when he said, I'm just kidding, go take a lap. He put his hands up defensively, as if seeing the recognition in my eyes. The lake was really cold that day, and stretched on forever in that waving black expanse. I stepped out carefully on my shaking legs, wanting to get away from Mark, while also terrified about going out there. When I was about waist high, I started swimming. He usually made me go to the buoys separating the deeper parts of the lake from the shallow part, so I thought I could hang there for a minute with the excuse of catching my breath. He would be annoyed, of course, but since he couldn't reach me from the shore, I'd be okay. I turned out to not be okay. The buoys were an orange beacon as I bobbed through the water. My arms were already feeling heavy and tired, but I pushed on. I could feel Mark stare on me all the while, and though I didn't look back until I got to them, I knew he would either be angry or disappointed that I was already out of breath. I reached them and clung onto one for support. Since it was so cool out, my hands were already clammy from being out of the water, and goosebumps started to make their appearance on my body. Aside from the few birds that flew overhead, I felt completely alone out there. I nearly had a little heart attack when something splashed beside me and a hand grabbed my shoulder. In reflex, I let go of the orange buoy and sank below the surface. The hand went with me, but instead of letting me go, it held me down. The muddy water stung my eyes. I couldn't see which way was up or down. I thrashed and tried to get away from this hand. My chest hurt, and I couldn't take it anymore. I gasped for air. My mouth quickly filled up with lake water, and I screamed. Blood was rushing hard in my ears, and I couldn't even hear myself thinking. The hand tugged me up suddenly, holding my head out of the water, before plunging me back down again. I didn't even get a chance to breathe in. The hand did this several more times. I can only remember a blur of water after that. I thought to myself, this is it. Mark said they'd come for me, the monsters, and they did. And then, suddenly I was back on the shore, coughing and retching, trying to fill my lungs as fast as possible. I heaved myself over onto my stomach, and water rushed out of my throat onto the ground. Mark was standing over me, grabbing my back and slapping it, making sure all the water came out. The grip felt familiar, and as I calmed down and looked up at Mark, I understood why. Instead of concern or worry crossing his face, he was laughing, not even trying to hide it. I knew then it was never the lake monsters that had dragged me under. Come on, take it easy, kid, he said, reining in his mocking laughter. I knew you needed some motivation, but that was pathetic. You nearly drowned. He did this to me, all to motivate me to swim better, or to scare me. As a literal kindergartner who just almost drowned, I couldn't find the words to express what I was feeling at that moment. All I could do was burst into tears and cry until my lesson was over. Mark brought me my towel and didn't speak to me until my mom pulled into the parking lot above the beach. He leaned in close and I could still smell his breath to this day, like he'd eaten something spicy for lunch. He whispered in a low voice, don't tell anyone, or next time I won't pull you back up. Do you understand, kid? I didn't say anything. I just nodded and went to the car. Mark waved to my mom and smiled as I got in. She asked me how my lesson went, and paused when I just said good. She asked if I was okay, but I didn't say anything for a long while. I guess I was in shock after what just happened. Finally, I just said, I hate swimming. I don't want to go anymore. And we never did. My mom pulled me out of those swimming lessons, and I never went to another trainer again. Hell, I didn't even touch the idea of swimming or going into any water after that, even public pools in the gym or otherwise. I just kept seeing Mark's face after he pushed me under the water, or feeling his hand on the back of my head, 
feeling my lungs still burning whenever I looked at a body of water bigger than a puddle. I've had my wife look over this, and she thinks it's sad and really well written. She hugged me for a long time after I finished writing it, and I'll thank her forever for urging me to go to therapy. I'm not on a complete road to recovery yet, but I know I'll get there someday with her support. I don't know where Mark is now or if he's still teaching kids, but I hope he had his head held underwater at least once, just so he'd know how it feels. The saying, blood is thicker than water, is a familiar one. It means your blood relatives or family unit should be your only loyalty, and giving them up for anything outside of it should be highly frowned upon. That being said, there's another phrase I can coin that means something more to me, associated with an event I'll never forget no matter how long I live. Blood is thicker than oil, both in the metaphorical and literal senses. It all started on the day my parents told me they were getting a divorce. We lived on a huge property by a lake at the time, in a huge log cabin style house. They hosted parties every summer, with friends and neighbors out on the lake. There would be music, the smell of hot dogs and hamburgers on the grill, and the lake looming over the horizon, reflecting the firelight and whatever color of fireworks we chose that night. It was at one of those parties that my parents started acting really strange. They were usually on opposite schedules throughout the week, but on these weekend parties they reconnected, laughed, and danced with each other as if they were together 24-7. But that night they seemed to be on opposite sides every time I looked for them. Whenever I asked if they were going to dance tonight, my mom just straightened her mouth and didn't say anything. My dad would shrug and say he'd catch up with her later. At 13 years old, I knew something was off, but I couldn't think of anything to try and fix it. Different neighbors milled in and out of our house for water and snacks, and to use the bathroom, as the party went into the later hours. The breeze was still lukewarm, but eventually I had to go up to my room to get a jacket. Our house was very large, and my room was at the end of the hall at the right, on the side of the house that faced the lake. I passed a few people who smiled and waved as I went up the stairs, but aside from the top landing where the bathroom was, the upstairs was really quiet. I usually go inside once or twice to give myself a moment to breathe and decompress from these parties. I have sensory processing issues, and excessive chatter for too long makes me disassociate. That's definitely what I needed tonight. I was already feeling not all there from all the noise outside, and just needed five or ten minutes. That's all. But five or ten minutes was all it took for my life to change. I got to my room, shutting the door softly behind me, and taking a seat on my bed. I left the lights off because I felt particularly light-sensitive that day. I lay there in the dark for a few minutes, breathing and not thinking much about anything. The quiet felt like swallowing a spoonful of warm honey. It was really good and relaxing. My quiet moment was shattered, though, when I heard splashing through the open window. Not the regular kind of splashing, either. Frantic, desperate splashing that sounded like a little kid had fallen in or something. My trance broken, I raced to the window to look out. I still felt disconnected to my surroundings, but I was there enough to be able to see what was going on. I almost didn't want to believe it. Down there in the dim glow of the moonlight and light from the bonfire around the corner, I saw my dad. He was bent over waist deep, wrestling with something. At first, I thought he was play wrestling with his brother or playing chicken or something. He was childish like that even at 40. But I quickly realized that wasn't the case when a man I knew popped out of the water trying to punch my dad and get ashore. But my dad snatched him back and tackled him back in, pinning his head under again. It was Mr. Welsh, our next door neighbor, a man we'd had at those parties every weekend. He and his wife often babysat me when my parents went out to dinner. He repaired our plumbing when I flushed Legos down the toilet. Everything neighborly you could think of, and there my dad was trying to drown him right in front of me. Not that he knew I was there, 
but I think he would have done this even if my bedroom light was on. I watched as they continued to struggle. When Mr. Welsh didn't come up for a minute and his body stopped moving, I couldn't take it anymore. I ran downstairs out the front door. People stopped to talk to me, all smiling, but I ignored them and ran past. I turned the corner of the house. My dad was there coming out of the lake, but Mr. Welsh was nowhere to be found. I looked frantically out at the water, but I couldn't see him anywhere. My dad just looked at me. His shoulders sagged. I could swear something broke inside him. He collapsed to the ground and sobbed into his hands, repeating the same thing over and over. I fucking killed him. I killed him. My parents sat me down later and told me they were getting a divorce. The meeting was closely monitored, of course. The jail guards weren't going to let a kid near an alleged murderer alone, even if he was his son. I learned that apparently my mom had been having an affair with Mr. Welsh, one that lasted for years before my dad found out. He was devastated and confronted her a few days before the party. When she refused to leave Mr. Welsh and asked for a divorce, my dad took his rage out on the only thing he could think of, Mr. Welsh himself. He'd seen him talking and dancing with my mom at the party, and something inside him snapped. He asked Mr. Welsh down to the lake around the side of the house to look at the dock. When they were all alone, my father dragged him to the water. I still don't know how to feel about either of my parents. I was sent to live with my grandparents in another town as everything played out, and only saw them on supervised visits. I know I can't forgive my mom for what she did to my dad, but I also feel weird around my dad, too, for the awful thing I saw him do. His anger was understandable, of course. It's what he did with it that makes me so unsettled. He's told me he still loves me a lot and will be there for me when he gets out. I believe him. I just don't know if I'm ready to accept everything yet. Mr. Welsh's body was never recovered. My dad was convicted purely on circumstantial evidence. Some days, I think of driving out to the old lake house where I grew up, and my innocence was lost, and looking out at that great expanse of water. Maybe one day, Mr. Welsh will finally be found in that lake, or maybe he never will. I work summers as a camp counselor in northern parts of Ontario, Canada. On the date this particular incident occurred, I was camping with a group of 10-year-old boys on the same lake the summer camp was based on. Like a routine camping trip, we canoed out to the site and set up our tents. Me and my co-worker Mike took turns supervising the kids while we swam, built forts, and played games. We cooked some food over the fire, sat around, and told stories cooked s'mores, the typical Canadian camping experience. At around 9.30, I tell the kids it's time for bed, and they head off into their tents, which were positioned a small walk away from the shoreline, but still within line of sight from where we had the fire pit. Me and Mike were shooting the breeze by the water, smoking a cigarette, and basically just hanging out, before we decided to head into our own tent and call it a night. What happened next still troubles me to this day, and remains my go-to scary campfire story. We were both gazing into the pitch-black night water, when we saw a small light approaching us slowly, slightly above water level. We speculated what this could possibly be for a few moments, before it came close enough for us to see. The light was mounted on the front of a kayak, and someone was approaching our campsite, now, it's important to note that as a camp counselor, part of our training goes over how to deal with stranger encounters in an environment where we're responsible for a group of children on public property. I was prepared to give this mystery paddler the typical speech about how we were camping with a group from a recognized organization and we were respectfully asked they find another campsite. This person's appearance shook us to the bone, though, as the light drew nearer. Paddling this kayak was a woman who looked to be in her 60s. She had incredibly long wisps of gray hair that was trailing off into the water. Her skin looked like old leather, and her dead-looking eyes were tough to spot underneath all her wrinkles. 
She looked directly at me, and she spoke. I realized she was missing most of her teeth. Oh, are all the children safe in bed? She asked me, pointing in the direction of the tents, not really knowing how to respond, and quite frankly crapping myself. I responded by telling her we were fine, and she had to leave. That's good, just as expected for this time. She smiled and then turned her kayak and paddled off into the night. At this point in time, myself and Mike were legitimately very creeped out. Not only because the appearance of this mystery woman, who resembled a corpse, but because of her inquiry on the whereabouts and safety of the children we had brought on this trip. Not knowing what else to do, we grabbed our hunting knives and sat by the fire after checking on the kids once more. A half hour later is where things really started to get creepy. Across the lake, a female counselor was leading another trip for kids the same age group. She sent me a text which read something along the lines of, Hey, Sean, stop screwing with us. This isn't funny. My kids are really creeped out. I instantly called her and let her know I had just seen someone near my campsite that seemed eerie and suspicious, and I was not trying to play any jokes. Apparently, one of their kids had opened their tent door to take a piss and seen a woman with long hair standing with her arms open toward them near the shoreline. I live in the countryside in an idyllic village where half the houses are vacation homes. Not much happens here, but if you enjoy nature, it's a pretty great place to live. I'm an outdoorsy kind of woman, with my favorite element being water. I do kayaking, diving, swimming, anything water-related I can get my hands on. I was on my way home from my night shift. I had this job just for one summer at a halfway house. It's a home for eight recovering addicts, and there has to always be two people working there at night, just in case. It's usually very calm. We play cards, watch TV, cook. It's pretty easy money. Back on topic, I was driving home, and as I always do, I stopped at the little secluded lake for a swim. I can never resist a good swim, and always got a bikini in the car just in case. This lake isn't very large, but it is crystal clear and surrounded by a beautiful forest. You would never even know it was there if no one told you. The little road that leads down to the beach is fairly narrow and well hidden. As a result, there's almost never anyone there, aside from the occasional dog walker. I had only just started to swim out into the lake when I felt that my car key, which I kept tied onto a piece of string around my ankle, didn't feel quite tight enough. I was afraid it would slip off and be lost in the water. Instead of swimming straight out into the lake, I quickly made my way around a little rocky part of the headland. This area was slightly L-shaped. I was in the angled portion and could see through to the beach and the car as I fastened the string better. I just so happened to look up towards my car. My spot was slightly hidden, not far from the beach or the car, behind the corner of this area. As I watched the car, I didn't notice him at first. I had to really squint to make sure what I was seeing wasn't an illusion or a trick of my imagination. But as I looked closer, I saw that squatting behind my SUV was clearly a man. A man in a bright yellow hoodie. I didn't see his face, of course, and it was too far away to actually see who this was anyway. But I recognized this person's hoodie. This guy must be Creepy Freddy. He was only 17, but he was very unstable. He'd never returned from his visit to his parents the day before. We called the police, of course, but since he usually turns up on his own after a few days of freedom and drugs, the police often advise us to just wait and see. He'd earned his nickname of Creepy Freddy. After assaulting a girl for no other reason than that he felt she was too beautiful, Thankfully, she hadn't been injured badly, but it was still extremely creepy. Indeed, he had a very long history of drug-induced violent outbursts. Even if he was nice enough when he was sober, he was a nightmare when he wasn't. 
I thought about trying to get up, leaving the car behind, and trying to walk towards the main road. But what if he spotted me and chased after me? I had no idea if he was in a fit state or not. I was also barefoot in my orange bikini. I would be very easy to spot. I decided against the risk of enduring a face-to-face -face encounter with a possibly drugged up and possibly armed Freddy. That was too big a risk. I considered my other options, and I realized there was only really one. To swim across the lake and reach the little cluster of vacation cottages that occupied the opposite beach. As quietly as I could, I started to swim over. The swim took me over 90 minutes. I kept turning around to see if I was being followed. When I reached the other beach, I was completely exhausted and cold. I walked up the sandy beach as a young mom and her kids spotted me. I explained the situation and she phoned the police and fed me some scones and coffee and the best waffles I ever had. The police arrived only to find Freddy gone. All four of my tires had been slashed. I resigned from my job at the halfway house where he stayed soon after, and Freddy is, as far as I know, still not found to this day.